All right, guys, what's going on? Bit of a different format. We're just going to be talking about the new DLC stuff. So if you guys haven't seen it, make sure to go to totalwar.com slash blog. And from there, you can get access to all the same stuff. You'll be able to read it yourself if I go through it a little bit quick. But yeah, basically, we're just going to be talking about all this uh, good stuff here. It's going to be fun. The Hunter and the Beast, the Dread Wookiee and it comes. Hopefully you guys like that thumbnail. But yeah, for tonight's stream, we're going to be talking about all the DLC stuff. And then from there, we're actually going to go play some quick battles. So Aerocrastic said he might be free. So we'll probably be playing some games after this. So if you guys, you know, aren't interested in the discussion, you just want to see battles, I would recommend coming back in like half an hour or so. Because we're going to be diving in, taking a look at this, maybe talking about some of the implications for the metagame. And uh, yeah, what it means for these factions should be quite a bit of fun. I know, turn it. Yeah, turn inception. Yeah, with the uh, the OBS. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. I'm incredibly excited. Man, some of the builds that are going to be opened up by that war wagon. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm really, really hyped. It's going to be fun. So, guys, thank you for joining. We're just going to be going through the blog here and taking a look. So, the Hunter and the Beast is the latest Lord pack for Total War Warhammer 2, introducing two rival legendary lords from the Warhammer World of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, each with their own objectives, mechanics, playstyles, units, etc., etc. You guys get it. And they're going to be available in the Eye of the Vortex and Mortal Empire campaign. So... I will be doing one campaign when it comes out. I'm not sure which one, but probably the Empire. I mean, the Hunts Marshal, like, he's so cool. And the wagon, I mean, I feel like having a campaign where your entire army is just those, like, haggard wagons, like, kiting around the AI is going to be, like, so good. So, I don't know. But the Lizardmen have, like, the giant beast. It's, like, it's going to be a great DLC. I mean, Empire is, like, one of the coolest factions, hands down. And so are dinosaurs. So, so yeah. We'll talk about all that stuff. And I will be taking questions. Uh, the Hunter of the Beast includes two legendary lords. We have Marcus Wolfhart, the Huntsman. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun to see. I mean, hopefully he's... I hope he's a little bit better than Alithanar. And I have a feeling he will be since he's kind of the mainstay of the DLC. Like, he's probably going to give some buffs to, like, nearby units and different things like that, that. I mean, not to say that Alithanar doesn't, but hopefully they'll be more impactful. And I feel like he should have some sort of an item, like the Mark of the Hunter, where, like, Marcus Wolfhart, like, points at a target and, like, all the other focus fire. Kind of like uh, Prey of Nothrema, but without the snare, maybe. Maybe he just has a slow. Who knows? I mean, because like in the trailer, he literally has a las cannon shooting. But basically, we're not going to show the trailer. Pretty much every content creator and their mom already put the trailers up on their channel. So I figured we'll just jump right into the juice here. Uh, two legendary lords. We get a hunter general, which is basically just going to be the Walmart version of Marcus Wolfhart and ancient Croxagors, which uh, yeah, I wonder what, what the difference will be. You know, I feel like the ancient Croxagors might be like an anti-large specialist, you know, just to kind of vary them from the regular Croxagors, because having them just be like a regular kind of a... You know, freaking croc score with better stats isn't that interesting. So I bet I bet it'll be something different, like an anti-large kind of, you know, big, big alligator beast. A head-to-head -head campaign with Italian Spartacus. Yeah, that would be really fun. Empire vs. Dinos or something. <laughs> An entire army of Wookiee wagons. Dude, I love it. All right, so uh, new Empire units. We get archers, huntsmen, and war wagons. So from what I saw below, I think there's somewhere here where it says the archers are actually, or the huntsmen, are anti-large archers, which is really interesting. Now, the issue being is that are they going to have good AP? That's really going to be the make or break on those guys because that like is a huge difference maker. If they get an anti-large missile unit that has like good AP values, man, that is going to be bananas. Regular archers, it's okay. Like it gives some niche kind of buff because the regular archers, crossbowmen have 160 range. So I would imagine the regular empire archers are going to have like 170 or 180, which does matter in some matchups, but still I feel like that's kind of a, I don't know. I don't really see the application of the archers outside of campaign. I bet you the archers in the campaign are going to have their own kind of, a, you know, skill trees and things you can buff them with in conjunction with crossbows. But there really needs to be something to kind of set them apart. Uh, the Huntsman, the War Wagon. The War Wagon, depending on the cost and, you know, its, uh, it's accuracy and a bunch of other variables, could be an absolute beast. I mean, the War Wagon could be something that you could build whole builds around. Imagine having like three War Wagons uh, with whatever artillery they have on their backs. And then you have Pistoliers, you have Outriders, and you have Heavy Calf. I mean, that is going to be... That is going to be crazy. That is going to be crazy. And I was going to save it for when more people were here. <laughs> Come on. You don't, don't kill the hype. I have it right in front of me. And I made something really cool for the channel, which I'll show you guys once we get more people here in chat. But the War Wagons, um, I think they could be pretty good. Like, honestly, it, it's going to... I don't know how good it will be with, like, static Empire builds, but, like, having it be something... And it depends on how fast it is, too, because I bet you it'll be in the ballpark of, like, 60 speed or 50 speed, so... You're going to need to have some, like, covering fire. I really think that War Wagons with, like, Pistoliers and Outriders kind of supporting it is going to be super obnoxious because the things that can catch the War Wagon are going to be, like, high-speed Skirmisher Cab, which you can tear apart with Pistoliers and, you know, Empire Knights and things like that. So, yeah. So, it could be good. But, yeah, the Empire uh, Anti-Large Archers. Somebody in chat says, uh, yeah. Could be good against Wood Elves, for sure, I suppose. Against some of the, the Flying Beasts. Uh, new units for Lizardmen are going to be the Dread Saurian, so that's going to be just the big thickness that you guys saw in the trailer. That thing is going to be sweet. Now, I wonder how they're going to do it. I have a feeling that 
the we already have pretty good anti-large with the dinos in the form of carnosaurs so i feel like the dread soaring is going to be like more of like a generalist unit it could either have really good combat stats and just be like or average combat stats and be good against infantry and large or they could make it like a bonus first infantry threat typically like big monsters like that you know like uh bastilodons and uh you know mammoths are more infantry focused but i think the dread soaring will probably be infantry focused sacred croc score is going to be just juicier Hopefully these guys are going to be like kind of anti-large beat sticks. I think that'd be really cool to give them like anti-large infantry in the front line. Uh, but I mean, they already have Temple Guard, so do they really need that? I don't know. And then Razor Dawn Hunting Packs. So yeah, we'll see what these guys are. Should be interesting to see those guys in action. Is that going to be like the Feral version of the Razor Dawn? Yeah, because we have Riders already, right? So the Hunting Packs here, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see that. I feel like War Wagons are the tool to prevent your Empire Gunners from getting yanked by flying creatures or chaos breaking through your front line. Yeah, that's a really good point. Is that the if you want to have a gun line with the Empire, but you're facing off against a faction like like Beastmen or Chaos or Norska, these Zerging factions that make it almost impossible to have a handgunner line. Because if you're playing Empire, you're playing against a good Beastmen player, a good Chaos player, any of those type of factions, you're not really going to be able to have a functional handgun line. But Having these wagons gives you an option for a gun line, essentially, a mobile gun line, which I think is really good against these factions. Now, the Empire can stop Chaos's Cav. They have Demogriff Knights. They have uh, Reich's Guard to stop Hounds and Empire Knights to stop Hounds. Like, they can control the mobile game very well. So I feel like the wagons are going to be very punishing against these uh, slower infantry factions, for sure. Yeah, that's Ripper Dactyl. That's right. So, yeah, the Razor Dawn hunting packs are going to be something completely different. So, um, yeah, it'll be fun to see those guys in action. I can't really speculate too much uh, without knowing the lore on the unit and things like that. Razodons are like anti-infantry salamanders. They shoot spikes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, the Razodon hunting packs. Okay, that's going to be cool. Yeah, because the salamanders are bonus first large. So the Razodon hunting packs, like uh, Plessy, thank you. And this is why we're doing it live. So I can get some feedback from you guys. Uh, the Razodon hunting packs seem like, uh, based on what he told me, and I'm remembering the model now. I remember looking it up a long time ago when the Lizardmen first came out, like all their models and tabletop. Yeah, they'll probably be like a mobile bonus first infantry pack, which is cool. So imagine the synergy of Salamanders uh, with Anti-Large, and then you have these guys to kind of just roast infantry, which is pretty neat, for sure. Razor Dons or Anti-Infantry and AP Missile Skirmisher Monsters. It'll probably say that all below, too. We're just kind of in the top right now. So uh, when will it be released? On uh, September 11th, The Hunter and the Beast will be coming out. Is there a pre-purchase discount? You'll get 10% if you pre-purchase. Yeah, pretty standard stuff there. Will the new Legendary Lords be fighting for control of the Vortex? Both Marcus Wolfhart and Akai will be playable in the Eye of the Vortex campaign, but... Yeah, they're going to have their own destinies. So it's, it's going to be like the Vampire Coast, right? It's not going to be something where, you know, they're going to try and, you know, work the ritual's magic, like, you know, the Skaven or these other factions. Like, Marcus probably wants to hunt some giant beast. I bet you Marcus Wolfhart's, like, final thing will be to hunt, like, the legendary Dread Saurian, right? Much like it is in, uh, uh, for example, in uh, in the Vampire Coast campaign. You, you know, uh, Luther's trying to hunt the, the Kraken, or not really a Kraken, but you guys get it, the Sea Beast. So he'll probably have something where he hunts like a, a super big Dread Saurian. And what's cool about that is there, there will probably actually be a model for that, considering the Dread Saurian's going to be in the game already. So that's really cool. Um, we'll have their own destinies to fill, fulfill, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So will the new Legendary Lords be available in both Eye of the Vortex? So yeah, you can play them in both Mortal Empires and Eye of the Vortex. What new units will be in the Hunter of the Beast? The Hunter and the Beast will feature Archers, Huntsmen, War Wagons, Dread Saurians, Sacred Croc Scores, Razor Dons. We already talked about that a little bit. So any questions here? Lizardmen are going to be so fun. I know. I mean, God, a Croxagore, like Legendary Lord. Is it a Croxagore? Yeah, Nakai's a Croxagore, right? He's not like a Saurus. Yeah, he, he looks like a big, thick Croxagore. It's so cool in the trailer when he gets like his beat stick and he's like, oh, it's paddling time. And he's like, he's like playing with it in his hand. Oh, that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. So, uh, Wolfhart's hunters. So, scattered through Lustria are four of the finest hunters that ever lived. Wolfhart may attempt to track them down and acquire their services to aid in their expedition success, their expedition success, and subsequently developing each hunter's unique attributes and learning the tales of their... That's really cool. From, like, a story-driven perspective, you're going to be able to kind of learn about these, like, new fleshed-out characters, and you can also use them, which is going to be fun. Imagine having, like, this pack of hunters. So, Jorik Grimm, obviously a dwarf, a brilliant master engineer, shunned for his eccentric ideas, and he has struck out alone to seek his fortune in Lustria. It's going to be good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll show it. So, so Anna made this, this glorious, glorious, uh, let me see if I can actually, you guys ready for some inception? I think it'll, yeah, no, it's still there. Okay. So she made this like emblem or badge for the, my channel logo. It is so cool. Check this out guys. <laughs> That's a paddling. And this is something we might make, make eventually. Like I'm, Anna and I are going to be working on a WordPress website that like covers esports and total war. And I'll also have like merchandise and other things like that. But so this is like an emblem and we could do them for like green skins in every faction and you guys could put it on your fridge or whatever else you want to do with it, like a, a paperweight. But yeah, it's really, really cool. So you can see it has my logo there and it's incredibly awesome. I don't know how good the lighting is here, but hopefully it's uh, it's pretty good. I'll, I'll stop moving it back and forth. Oh, there you go. I can actually look below and see. Yeah, you guys can see that pretty good. 
so yeah, amazing work. I mean, Lady Turn, obviously, very, very talented. So there's going to be all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, the Four Hunters are uh, ex-spies characters from Vermintide. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? So we can make those for like green skins and like every other faction and like whatever you guys want. We could like make those in like mass production, essentially. And she makes them very quickly. So um, yeah, so stay tuned, guys. Details on that. Lady Turn, of course, is always doing journal commissions and other stuff you guys are interested in. Uh, yeah, in the community section, check it out. She's the best. So we have Jorik Grimm, the dwarf. We have Roderick, Le La and Gui. And he's going to be the renowned paladin disgraced and exiled. And he's haunted by his past that he cannot escape. Hertwig von Hall, a skilled physician. Oh, that's cool. So he's probably going to have like some sort of healing ability. That's really neat. Man, that's a cool thing. Like adding like a medic character to the empire. Wouldn't that be cool if that was actually something they got? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. So yeah, he's uh, has traveled far from home for his quest for ultimate vengeance, but against who? So that kind of like the narrative of this is really neat. Like each of them has their own story. I bet if you like go after Roderick, for example, there's some past he needs to kind of overcome. You can help him with that in a quest line. Same with Hertwick. Like that is so rich and fun. Like he has something ultimate vengeance, right? So that's going to be its own tangent you can go after. So I think we're going to have to play the Empire. Quest, the Empire. We're going to have to do it, guys. It just seems it seems too cool. And then we have a Kalara of a Wydrioth. The eminent Waystalker has traded the force of Avalorn for jungles of Lustra in pursuit of redemption. So the story arc of like all these characters seems really interesting. I'm pretty excited for that. The Emperor's Mandate, Wolfhard's campaign and progress is measured by how effectively he, he fulfills the Emperor's Mandate. Expansion, successful military operations and other campaign activities increases acclaim, which is tracked on the Emperor's Mandate bar. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like infamy with the Vampire Coast, I would imagine. And obviously there'll be things that uh, you know, can be a little bit different there. This will dictate the quality of the units he can recruit via the Imperial Supply System. So obviously you're on, you're on another content, right? It's like the New World, so he's going to have Imperial Supplies coming in. So there's going to be a whole system with that. That's going to be really fun, which dispatches higher quality units that can be recruited. As Mandate Bar fills, he will also unlock bonuses to further improve these units, plus high-tiered recruitment buildings not initially available to Wolfhard's faction. So, I mean, come on, guys. Who, who are we kidding here? Who are we kidding? We're all going to be just massing wagons. It's going to be literally like 50 wagons just riding with Wolfhart, like riding on the back of one with a bow. Oh my God. If, imagine if Wolfhart has a freaking mount. Like imagine if Wolfhart has a mount that's a wagon and he can like ride on it with his bow. Oh my God. That would be awesome. Um, in the Eye of the Vortex campaign, filling the Emperor's Mandate bar will cause Nakai the Wanderer to issue a final challenge to Marcus Wolfhart. Oh, the duel of the duels. With Mortal Empires being a sandbox experience, we like to leave how you complete the campaign up to you. But I think we'll do Eye of the Vortex because having him have the glorious duel with Marcus Wolfhart, come on, come on. And uh, regarding the rework of the old school empire, we're going to be getting to that below. I believe there's more details. So Wolfhart's plundering will inevitably stir up hostility and prompt retaliation from the natives. Prolonged aggressive activity such as military actions and raiding can raise hostility through five, uh, five levels. Conversely, a more passive approach to the campaign will cause hostility to fall. Interesting. So yeah, it's like the more aggressive you are, the more kind of a, you know, the more problems you cause in the neighborhood, things can change. Each level has a negative effect on Wolfark's campaign, but hostility is also a measure of his aggression against the local inhabitants. As he ascends through hostility levels, reinforcements are dispatched more frequently via the Imperial supply system. Okay, so the more hostile you are, you get more reinforcements from the mainland, but the strength of these reinforcements is still dictated by the Emperor's Mandate Bar. So if you're going to be like super aggro, you have to make sure that your Mandate Bar is like really high, it would seem, because you get reinforcements, but otherwise you may like kind of starve out and get surrounded, so... When peak hostility is reached, a variety of penalties will be imposed on Marcus, along with the dispatch of Special Lizardman Task Force. Oh, that is so cool. So the Lizardman Goon Squad comes in. Yeah, Duel of Fates times 10. That's so awesome. With the sole aim of defeating the expedition. He will instantly receive uh, an Imperial Supply Drop and will need to uh, survive for a number of turns before the hostility bar resets. So it becomes like a horde mode where he's like surviving against a horde of like Lizardman Task Force. That is so, so awesome. Oh man. They announced that Gorok is the free DLC you're saying in Twitter? I hope that's true. Man, that's really neat. Maybe we'll have to do another video on that. What new mechanics will Nakai the Wanderer, so far? for all you dino fans out there, we're now going to be talking a little bit about the dinos. Nakai the Wanderer will bring with him the following brand new mechanics. Before we talk here, we'll see if there's any questions. Uh, by the way, I had the original Turin wagon. I'd link the picture, but I don't think I can. If you can send it to me in Discord right now, I can, I can like show it to the stream and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, that's a really good idea, Numer. You like using them as Patreon things? That's a really good That's a really good idea for the uh, emblems. Yeah, hell yeah, man. All right. <laughs> 19 Dread Saurians. <laughs> All right. So, 
Nakai has warm blood invaders. In the Eye of the Vortex campaign, Nakai must fight to keep Lestri in the rightful hands of the Lizardmen. Several Empire colonies have been established. Each is encroaching on the jungle. They must be dealt with. Four extremely dangerous hunters co-coordinate the efforts of the warm bloods. Hunt them down to draw out their leader, Marcus Wolfhart. So basically, it's it's the inverse. You have to hunt down the four hunters that we saw above, and then Marcus is the final, you know, cockfight that you're going to have, which is cool. And that's only for the Vortex campaign. In the uh, in you know the Mortal Empires, it's going to be more of a sandbox experience. And he's actually a horde faction, so Nakai isn't going to be like base centric, which you know it's going to play like Beastmen and Chaos. But obviously, it's like it's how Beastmen and Chaos should be. It's like they're all juiced up. They're awesome. Like, you know, there's a ton of cool mechanics and the Beastmen and Chaos obviously don't really have those right now, but it'll probably be something we'll get someday. Uh, Nakai's faction, the Spirit of the Jungle, offers a unique variation on Horde gameplay. Each army in his faction, when placed in the encampment stance, may develop its settlement infrastructure. Okay, so it's like the Vampire Coast pirate ships. You're going to have uh, mobile cities, essentially, much as the standard settlement would. The infrastructure is preserved when the Horde moves off and may be further developed during future periods of encampment. So pretty standard stuff for Horde armies. If the Horde is destroyed in battle, all of its infrastructure is lost along with the army. That is brutal. Brutality. Brutality. Oof, oof. So yeah, it's basically like if you lose it, you know, the city crumbles. Pretty tough stuff, but again, you got to be more careful. Um, these changes are designed as a quality of life improvement for Horde gameplay. Unifying recruitment buildings uh, choices under Nakai saves the repetition cost and time that would otherwise be required to construct the same recruitment building across multiple Hordes. Oh, okay. So like when you have it with one with Nakai, when his Horde is able to develop these buildings, your entire like army infrastructure gets that. So you don't have to like rebuild it. That's really cool. So big, big change there, guys. Big, big change. So if Nakai is able to build up infrastructure, your other horde armies are going to be able to recruit based on that infrastructure. It would seem, based on what this says here. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it's saying. So defense of the Great Plan. Nakai uh, begins play with a vassal faction called the Defenders of the Great Plan, the caretakers of the Great Temple Cities. When one of Nakai's armies captures a region, it may be gifted to the Defenders. Oh, that's pretty cool. So how this works is when Dekai captures cities with his horde army, he can give them to a vassal nation. So normally these hordes would have to raise or destroy them and just move on or plunder, but he's able to give them to an AI vassal faction, which is basically your minion. So you have a you have a city infrastructure, but you don't have to manage it. The AI is going to manage that. You manage your horde. I really like that. It's kind of cool. Like it, it takes away the monotony of, of like the late game of just having like, you know, you, you raise and pillage with chaos and beastmen, for example. And then what happens is, is like AI just moves in and recaptures and you're like, ah, I have to go back and deal with them now. But now you're going to be able to leave an AI infrastructure, which will defend it for you. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Did I miss a paragraph here? No, I, I didn't miss a paragraph. I think we got it. Yeah. As more templates are dedicated to the specific old one, the more powerful the reward bestowed upon the kindness faction. Oh, to a specific old one. When a region is gifted, Nakai must choose which old one. Okay, so there, I guess there's kind of a pantheon of old ones, and Nakai can essentially dedicate them, much like in the Norska campaign. You can go to the Crow, the Raven, you know, Nurgle, Korn, Zinch, you know, Slanesh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you get a specific reward. So Nakai's campaign is going to have a very uh, similar uh, system to Norska. Yeah, which is very, very cool. So I like that quite a bit. Right on, right on. And uh, yeah, I will, uh, Mr. Void, I will show the, the video once we get to some of the quick battles after this. So... That is pretty gangster. So Nakai has a selection of rights focused around his units. Oh, yeah, okay, we missed this. These temples generate a unique resource called Old One's Favor. Nakai may expend this favor to provide assistance to his vassals through unique rights, boost income. Vassals provide the visibility over them so you can see everything and recruit blessed spawnings or heroes, salons, etc., etc. Very cool stuff. I like that system a lot. Oh, unique rights here. Nakai has a selection of uh, new rights focused around his units, faction mechanics, and campaign focus. The right of allegiance, performing this right, will cause attrition to enemy, enemies of Nakai's vassals. Okay, so that's much like the Tomb Kings, where they can use the Vortex, the Zerud Sandstorm, and they can just like sandstorm all their enemies uh, you know, as they enter their territories. So, for example, if you're off doing something else and your vassals are just getting pound town, you can use this to the right of allegiance to uh, do some attrition to nearby armies and stuff. Yeah, which is very cool. You're saying I missed a paragraph up above? The new horde mechanics. Okay, Spirit of the Jungle, we got that. Each army. Camp and Stance, however, only Nakai's personal horde can unlock units for recruitment. Other hordes in his faction may then recruit unit types that he has unlocked. Okay. Yeah, we, we basically kind of skimmed over it, but yeah, we, we did touch on that. So the unique rights, we have the right of allegiance, the right of rebirth, the right spawn an army for Nakai's vassals, the defenders of the Great Ones at their capital to help protect them. Okay, pretty good. The right increases the recruit of the rank of Croxagore, Sacred Croxagores, and Croxagore Ancients while improving their weapon strength and armor. So yeah, the right of mastery, pretty juicy stuff. It's going to be good. Family Feud. Oh my god. Things are getting wild here in chat. So, what's the free content that will be released alongside the DLC? The free content 
that will be released alongside the Hunter of the Beast DLC includes Liz, uh, Lizardman Legendary Lord Gorok. So he's he's the legendary Croc score, like big old meaty dude. I think is he is he a Croc score? No, Gorok is Gorok is a Saurus, isn't he? I know one of these guys. Nakai the Wanderer is a Croc score. Gorok, I believe, is a Saurus. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not like a lore guy, so. I missed the paragraph above the new horde mechanics. Did I? Okay, let's go up here. In the eye of the vortex, and Kai must fight to keep luster in the rightful hands. We talked about the hunters. Uh, yeah, we talked. About, no, we didn't miss anything there. No, we talked about it. Maybe you just missed it or joined a little bit later, or maybe I just kind of skimmed over it. Um, the free content that will be released is going to be Gorok. There's a Mogwai man in chat. Oh, Mogwai man. We just watched uh, Goonies, not Goonies, but uh, Gremlins the other night with the Mogwai. Yeah, Gorok is a Sora, so he's, he's like a big beast. And I think he carries like a giant shield or something. It's going to be pretty cool. So various parts of the Mortal Empires campaign. And now this is for any of you guys in chat who are wondering about, uh, you're wondering about how like the old campaign is going to be affected, right? Because, you know, Marcus is getting all this gangster stuff. He's going to be fun. But what's happening to so good old Carl and the boys back in the old world? Well, let's find out. Various parts of the Mortal Empires campaign map have been reworked and improved, focused mainly on the regions within the Empire. So new provinces, Solend, and regions have been added with the boundaries of the Empire. So new Empire provinces, because there's a lot of kind of dead space, and this is going to add some flavor. New mountain pass regions have been added between the Empire and its neighbors, complete with all new Empire fort settlements, battlefields similar to the High Elf Gates. Okay, that's going to be cool. So there's going to be a little bit more defensibility for the Empire. New provinces and regions have been added for Albion. New Greenskin and Wood Elf factions have been added in the Drakwald and the Wasteland area of the Empire. So the Drakwald is, I believe, the southern kind of uh, forests. And then up north, kind of in that northeastern territory, where it's just this big wasteland, there's going to be some probably Greenskins and other things like that. So it's going to make the Empire a little bit more immersive. Like Typically, you were just fighting against like Empire Rebels, but now you're going to have like Wood Elves and, and Greenskins and other stuff nearby. New Empire Forts, new spectacular sediment battlefields exclusively for the New World Forts added in the Mountain Passes. That's really cool. So yeah, kind of like the Battle of Blackfire Pass is the most iconic battle for the Empire, one of them, right? You're going to have these new forts in the mountains that like the Greenskins and other invading factions from the south, and uh, I presume from the west and the north and et cetera, et cetera, are going to have to fight through. So that's very cool, like gate battles and things like that. Empire's the new wood elves with guns and armor. Yeah, basically, right? Balthazar Gelt is getting a new position as well in the new provinces. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll get to that as well. Uh, Empire co-campaign is now available. Oh, co-op campaign. Okay, that's neat. Yeah, and right here, Balthazar Gelt has a new starting position in Solund in the south of the Empire and a new faction, the Golden Order. So he's going to have his own traits, his own unique campaign, maybe his own objectives. So Balthazar Gelt, Big Pimp Daddy's finally getting his own, uh, he's getting his own ride, which is going to be cool. Drakwald is around Mindenheim. Okay, so that's kind of like east into the south a little bit, right? So new forts, new starting position for Gelt Daddy. Volkmar the Grim still riding dirty out of Altorf, it would seem. Empire Old World feature update. The Empire office system is being replaced. Oh, this is big, guys. This is big and juicy. So the Empire office system is being replaced with the new elector count system. This uh, political feature will make it possible to confederate with the Empire without going to war with the other counts if you play your cards right. So yeah, there's going to be an elector count system. So hopefully Karl Franz will be able to summon the elector counts. I hope so. New resource of prestige and imperial authority will be used to improve fealty with other elector counts via electoral machinations and imperial dilemmas and to exert your command over the Empire. So much like the High Elves, there's kind of a, a, a I guess, an influence system, which is going to be cool. 13 Elector Count positions to command, including the Wastelands and Sylvania. Oh, and unique rewards. So now there's going to be Rune Fangs. Oh, and exclusive units when commanding a state's capital. So I'm hoping that like Middenheim and these other Elector Count like cities are going to have unique units. Man, that is really cool. And the previous officer, officer system is defunct. Yeah, so I mean, that system wasn't that cool anyway. So I think that's cool. Misha, take care. Get some rest. I know it's a little bit tough for uh, you European folk here, but thank you guys for sticking around. Yeah. When will the free content be available? On release day, The Hunter of the Beast, 11th. It's going to be good to go, and it will be coming shortly after release for uh, Mac and Linux. Very cool. So, guys, that's that's. there's literally a button to summon the electric counts. Oh, that is so awesome. It shows a little bit about the electric count system. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. I'll take a look at that as well. So very, very neat stuff, guys. That is kind of a, a just a breakdown of, of the blog, which talks about everything. The electric count system, you're going to be able to summon them to war. And I'm sure there'll be all kinds of mechanics like that that are going to be very, very cool. So yeah, yeah. Nightly orders could be a thing as well. I mean, we're going to be finding out more details really soon because, I mean, this comes out, what, in like two weeks or something? So I would imagine there's going to be some substantial, uh, you know, information coming out and 
I'm sure CA will do their typical like early access streams and things like that. So, so guys, for anyone joining late or just joining now, we just did the breakdown of the blog, which discussed all the new mechanics and the new units and things like that. Um, on top of that, you guys can go back and check it out afterwards. This will be going up in about an hour or two. So how much do you think the Dread Saurian? Yeah, and feel free, guys. Any questions about speculation you have, I'm actually going to go play some battles right now. And any speculations you guys may have, like feel free to ask questions. Now is the time. Uh, how much do you think the Dread Saurian will cost in multiplayer? Probably like 3,000 plus. Like, Because like, okay, if you look at it from a lore perspective, Anna was telling me earlier, and uh, you know, obviously I've heard from Sotek, the Dread Saurian is like colossal. Like it, it, its size wouldn't really be perceivable in like regular Total War Warhammer, like in a fair way. And Kolek was the same way. When Kolek like attacks cities, like he peers over the walls of like the cities, like he is titanic. But for the sake of Total War, the Dread Saurian will be shrunk. It's going to be bigger than everything in the game, but it's still going to be, you know, shrunk down and it'll be... Uh, you think it'll be 2200? I don't think so. Because that's like the same price as the Sphinx of Usef. It's going to be like 3000 probably. Yeah. More dinosaurs? I know, the dinosaurs are coming. And the old friends are coming also. I don't know anything about the old friends actually, so... Uh, Elector Counts? Elector Counts? The Elector Counts are actually the rulers of the kind of a quote-unquote sovereign little uh, city-states of the Empire. So like Boris Todbringer is the Elector Count of Middenheim. And the empire like starts out like fractured and divided, right? And it's up to the emperor Karl Franz to bring all the elector counts into the empire, into one nation to fight against the, you know, the villains of the world. So that's kind of the main theme of that. So guys, we're going to be switching over to uh, some, some gameplay now. I don't know who the old friends would be. I mean, I mean, go imagine if it were Gotrek and Felix. God, that would be, that would be so awesome. Gotrek and Felix would just be amazing. So time for some inception here as we move over to, uh, some gameplay. So I'm going to fire up Total War Warhammer now. We're going to play a couple games. If you guys have any questions, check out the Steam page for unit info. Okay, I'll do that real quick. We can talk about that as well. The Steam page. All right. The Hunter and the Beast. So we're going to the Steam page right now. Wow, is that DLC? Is it only $8? What? So I guess Hunter and the Beast DLC is only eight bucks. It's a pretty good deal. All right, so we can actually come back to this right now. Hold on. So let's let's go back here. Yeah. So okay. So we're on the we're on the Steam page now. So Total War Warhammer: The Hunter and the Beast, September 11th, it comes out. Downloadable content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's see if there's any information. So we have obviously we talked about the Lords, new range units, mobile gunpowder batteries, Fabled Hunter heroes. I mean, does it have that much more detail for us here? The Emperor's Mandate, we already talked about this. It looks like this is all copy pasted from the blog. Okay, yeah, so here we go, guys. We have more details. How cool, I know. Felcon's all excited about the Croc scores. Look at him. One of the first players I've seen to popular, uh, popularize them. I think the Dread Saurian will be not anti large. I think it'll be like more like kind of a well rounded unit. Uh, so, okay, so we got some details about Marcus. Uh, a ranged combatant with powerful armor piercing bow. Okay, perfect. So this is good. We're going to talk a little bit more about the units here. So Marcus, so a Lithanar obviously has an AP missiles, deals bonus damage to large target, large target. So Lithanar doesn't have the bonus for large. So Marcus is going to be a little bit more particular in that respect. Coupled with Vanguard deployment stock, a 360 arc of fire and immune to psychology. Okay. So it doesn't talk about his items really, but let's see. Yeah, he's, it could be good. I mean, 360, so he can run and shoot. Same as a Lithanar, but the difference being is that he does, of course, have the anti-large bonus and good AP. So that makes him a little bit better. The bonus for his large is huge. I mean, that, that plays a big difference. So that's pretty neat. Uh, all right, immunopsychology, which is neat, so he can't be terrorized. He's a stalwart man. He's fought the greatest of beasts. In keeping with his reputation, he has ambush uh, defense chance, ambush success chance, and a large upkeep reduction for huntsmen and archers. Okay. Huntsman General, following Wolfhart, Wolfhart's example, his Huntsman Generals have Vanguard deployment, stock, a 360 degree fire arc, and arm unit psychology, and deal bonus damage against large targets. Okay, cool. Their fire arrow capabilities mean they synergize well with Bright Wizards. Oh, they shoot fire arrows. So if you have a Bright Wizard with Kindle Flame, they can actually do some pretty good damage. And of course, they grant reload rate to nearby troops. So more of a support character, perhaps, than uh, Marcus, but still very good. The backbone of the Wolfhart's hunting parties, these Imperial archers are inexpensive, plentiful, and quick. So kind of like peasant, peasant bowmen for Bretonia, I bet. Great, great at soaking enemy formations with range damage. Their, their loose formation enables them to trade fire with other... Oh, okay, so that's the difference. So if you're playing against another archer faction like elves or, or high elves, whatever, you name it, these guys come in a loose formation, whereas crosswomen are in a very tight regimented formation and they take more damage from you know enemy missiles. But archers actually come 
in a loose formation, that is actually very pertinent. That makes them viable, like that might make, depending on how cheap they are, that can make them okay against like high elves and wood elves and just factions that you just want to kind of throw annoying archers at. Like, because a lot of times when you play against wood elves, they're going to have their way watchers just pound your missile units, right? To kind of uh, take away your battlefield control. But if you have like loose formation archers, it might not be cost effective for them. Okay. So next we have the death, death jacks. So archers, regiment of renown. These elite archers also have stock, snipe, and vanguard deployment. Oh man, these guys are going to be like Empire Way Watchers, enabling them to strike fast, strike first, and uh, remain hidden from view. If well screened, they can continue to fire without fear. Okay, so we basically have the Natty Bubo Sharpshooters. That's pretty good. So Natty Bubo Sharpshooters for the Empire, not going to be as good because the range is going to be like 180 or something like that, but nonetheless, still pretty good. That's awesome. Behind you, thank you for the donation. That's for being one of those rare 40k players that talks about fantasy, even if it's not tabletop version. Hey man. All day. Thank you so much for the uh, donation there. I really do appreciate it. So that's real. These guys are going to be solid. I mean, a stalking, sniping, they can stay hidden. And if somebody can't like close the distance on them, you're going to have like perpetual value. I don't know about their AP values and things like that, but that's really good. Next, we have one of the finest archers to ascend to the ranks of huntsmen. Well-drilled and versatile. They have vanguard and stock. So kind of like shadow warriors, it looks like. Shadow warriors slash uh, deep wood scouts can fire while moving, have greater range than standard archers and accuracy, and they also have a bonus for large. So they're basically like probably a little bit less like punch than way, uh, than uh, uh, deep wood scouts and you know shadow warriors, but they do have anti large, which this is going to make them pretty good against factions like Vampire Coast. Huntsmen, for example, are going to be super good against uh, Morngulls, really good against uh, bloated <laughs> bloated corpses as well. You know all those big kind of lightly armored threats that the Vampire Coast does have, good against Vargulfs, probably pretty good in the Vampire Count matchup. So I think that's pretty solid. Boo ho from Florida, what's up, man? My neighbor? Oh, I don't know. My brother's probably out there with his dog. So, yeah, I would imagine that's it. Yeah, good night, guys. Sorry about the weird timing, but I just wanted to get it out right on launch day and just, you know, keep that hype going. Uh, so we have the White Wolves, Huntsmen, Regiment of Renown. Face, few face the White Wolves and live to tell of it. These elite Huntsmen match their bows with ruthless melee capabilities. So these guys are going to be like kind of a, the uh, Shadow Stalkers or whatever those things are called for uh, Nagarith, those kind of hybrid units. Or Shades, they could even be like Shades. Along with their Hunter attributes, they also encourage nearby friendlies and are immune to psychology. So they have encouragement. I don't think they're going to be that good. I mean, the kind of those weird hybrid units, shades are good because of their AP values, not because they're like a good dual purpose unit. I mean, it does help, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see how these guys perform. I'll, I'll definitely give them a try when they come out. Sunforge Gaming, did you talk about the unique heroes for Wolfheart? Yes, we did. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. We went over the lore and all that good stuff. So don't worry, I'll, I'll get to the wagon. Don't worry, it's going to happen. The war wagon, these mobile armored war wagons pack six riflemen each armed with an armor-piercing outrider. Okay, slower than standard missile cavalry, but far more resilient. They can fire while moving and in all directions. Oh my god. And reposition to place. Oh. They can be used as chariots and charged into lighter. Man, these things are going to be sweet because in the hands of a high-level player, if you guys have ever watched ECL or any of these big events we have, you'll notice that high-level players are extremely good at juking. So for example, if you're facing off against like a bow faction, miss bow missiles are very easy to juke. So having a war wagon with rifles like strafing back and forth is going to be so obnoxious. Oh my god, I'm excited for that. That is going to be so fun. Oh man, the war wagon with riflemen. Now the other variant, which is going to be the Bane of Elves, it's going to be the war wagon with a mortar. So these mobile artillery pieces carry less ammo than standard mortars, but make up for it by being able to move. So, man, the war wagon mortar is going to be hilarious. Like, because elves typically, one of the things they want to do against mortar plays is close the distance. But with the war wagons, you're going to be able to have like a fully like kiting force with wagons just mortaring their archers and their light targets. Oh, that's going to be fun. Oh, man. Are greenskins infantry considered large? No, they're not. They're not. So, um... Daniel Evans, to answer your question about footlords, footlords are typically bad. However, Marcus Wolfhart, for example, he has a he has a ranged piece. So that kind of takes away the issue of footlords being kited and dragged through the mud. So it doesn't really affect him as much, but obviously having a mobile lord often can be better. But I think I think Marcus will have his applications. Uh, as far as the Lizardman Lord goes, he has high mass. He's going to be able to push through threats. He's basically like a Throg type character. So Throg is very competitive. And I think that this guy may have a chance of being competitive as well, depending on his items and his abilities and stuff like that. So, yeah. <laughs> you bought a hurricane just to watch this? Or, or you bought a generator just to watch this? Oh, man. All right. So we have the mortars. We have the wagons. I'm incredibly excited. I, I cannot wait to play against a Chaos player with war wagons. I'm going to bring three of those. Demogriff Knights. Freaking Outriders, Pistoliers, and just freaking just kite into the Shadow Realm. That is going to be so much fun. That is going to be so much fun. 
All right, so we have the Black Alliance, War Wagon, Hellblaster, Volley Gun, Regiment of Renown, the ultimate unit in the Expeditionary's armory. The Black Lion is the devastating mobile light artillery piece. Uh, so this is what you guys saw in the trailer. While shorter range than standard Hellblaster Volley Gun, it can pump rounds into approaching troops until the last second. Oh my god. Oh my god, that is so cool. Guys, there's a mobile Hellblaster Volley Gun. And honestly, I think it might be good in some matchups. Like, I wouldn't say like top tier competitive per se, but it might be really oppressive. Like, Hellblaster Volley Guns are really good, but the issue is their range. So if you're playing against a very slow army and you have the kind of mobile advantage, you can harass with this like before the fighting starts. And they hit really hard. The issue is their range and kind of the cost. But with this, man, that could be really good. What's up, Shizuya? All right, so now let's talk. We already looked at all this kind of Wormblood Invader stuff, but let's go ahead and talk about the... Uh, the new unit. So here's Nakai. So Nakai has high armor. Obviously, he's a Croxagore health. He's probably going to have like, I would imagine like over five to six. He's going to have probably the same HP pool, HP pool as like Throck. Uh, melee attack, weapon strength. Nakai is a powerful brawler, well so suited to extended melee. So he's not going to be like, uh, you know, a specialist in either category, it seems. So he also grants a bonus to melee defense. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. So I wonder if the melee defense thing is in multiplayer, because if that is, that's going to be pretty good for like those Lizardman front lines, which are already super tough. Like having him in there as a bully is going to be quite nasty. All right, so Miasma of Despair, Speed, Vigor, and uh, Leadership Area Effect Debuff. Oh, that's pretty good. Vigor is actually a really underrated mechanic, and Leadership, of course, is quite good against like factions that, uh, you know, like Beastmen. Like I can see him being very good against Beastmen with Miasma of Despair. All right, uh, Support Abilities, Primal Roar increases Nakai's Physical Resist and Melee Attack and grants Rampage to Allies. Okay, so he rampages all nearby allies, but it gives melee attack. So this is basically like the Madness of Cain from the Dark Elves, which is going to be good. I mean, if you have Saurus, they're slow as hell, and you're in a grindy fight versus another faction, just pop this. Just pop it. Pop it like it's high. It's going to be good. And uh, you're going to be able to rampage and buff your nearby troops. And, you know, he'll probably have the, uh, you know, focus instincts or the cold blood. So you can de-rampage anything if you need to. So uh, perfect vigor for allies in range. Damn. Nakai has some juicy, juicy abilities. I mean, lowering speed, vigor, and leadership on nearby units. Uh, buffing melee, uh, physical resist, and melee attack on nearby buffs. Perfect vigor for allies in range as a constant effect. Man, that is really, really strong. That is really strong. Perfect vigor. Hot damn. That is really freaking good. So Nakai is going to be a beast. I think Nakai is going to be a lot better than Marcus. Like, a lot better than Marcus in terms of multiplayer. Campaign's a whole different beast, but in multiplayer, Nakai seems like a powerhouse. Uh, Ancient Croc scores. He's well armored. Okay, so this answered our question from earlier. So my apologies for anyone who uh, you know was wondering earlier. But uh, these well armored, hard hitting anti infantry specialists are cast in the mold of Nakai himself. So th they're just better Croc scores. They're just you, you have Walmart Croc scores and you have Ancient Croc scores. There you go. Uh, the Feral Dread Saurian. So if you thought Carnosaurs uh, were the apex predators of Lustria, think again. With breathtaking weapon damage and high armor. These towering walls of teeth and fury are versatile, elite killing, melee behemoths, and are su subject to rampage, of course. But with cold blood, and typically you're going to have a skink priest, you're going to have a, a, a warrior character, whatever. Like, you're going to have enough cold blood to de-rampage him. So it doesn't say if he's bonus for infantry or bonus for large. So I think my prediction earlier of him being uh, a dual-purpose unit, so being like something that's good against kind of everything or average against everything is good. And uh, Howda, I don't know what this is, but uh, the Dread Saurians, somewhat taller than their feral cousins, uh, though... No less capable. These titanic beasts are ridden into battle by skink skirmishers and do not rampage. Okay, that's pretty good. Probably going to be a lot more expensive. Like feral carnosaurs are 1600 and I think the, uh, the scar veterans are like almost 2k. So it's going to be probably a difference of like four or 500 gold. Yeah, which is going to be strong. These titanic beasts are ridden by skinks, uh, combining their terrifying melee power with four giant blowpipes. Oh, wow. Okay, so these guys are going to have like huge kind of firing batteries on their back. Now, I already, I already am weeping for the souls of all the Beastmen opponents that these things are going to face off against. Beastmen have so many problems with big single entities, but like this thing is just going to be, it's just going to be a terror in the night, guys. Oh my God. Oh, the Ancient Croxagore is a Lord, not a unit. Okay. Yeah, I totally missed that. Yeah, the Ancient Croxagore is, is not a Walmart variant. It's going to be like a Croxagore Lord. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, it says Sacred Croxagores as if it's like a multiple unit. It is, it is a little bit misleading here for sure. Yeah, we got it, guys. No worries. Thank you for the clarification, though. All right, so Ancient Croxagores, we talked about them, the Dread Saurian. The, so the Shredder of Lustria, oh, with nine stats and courage, a passive Hex Aura, reducing enemy leadership. Oh, good night, sweet Beastmen players. The Shredder of Lustria is truly one unit army and comes with a price tag to match. So the Shredder of Lustria is probably going to cost like four or 5,000 gold, which is going to be so fun in multiplayer, just having like a bunch of little skinks like worshiping this giant Dread Saurian. Uh, so the uh, the Sacred Croxagores is, is a lord. Yeah, so Sacred Croc scores these versatile, hard-hitting monstrous infantry. 
are great all-rounders with high weapon strength and magical attacks, which is, you know, pertinent against vampires and things like that. They can plow through a great variety of foes uh, than standard croc scores. Wait, okay, so ancient croc score is a hero. Or is it the sacred croc score? It's a little bit confusing. Yeah, anyways. So we have the cohort of Huadl, sacred croc scores, regiment of renown. Okay, so the sacred croc scores are the infantry. Like, they're the better ones. All right. So uh, the Cohort of Waddle is a top-tier monstrous infantry unit building on the Sacred Croc Scores capabilities with additional Armor Sundering. Okay, Armor Sundering is pretty good, actually, because stacking these guys with regular Saurus is going to be pretty good. It's much like the Femir stacking with Berserkers from Norska. They synergize well uh, with the field of Skinks and Saurus Warriors and Razor Dawn Hunting Packs, filling the air with deadly Grapeshot-style volleys. Armor Piercing Fire! Oh, that's good. Really good against Chaos, man. Razor Dawn Hunting Packs are potent and mobile. It's really funny because now both the Empire... Plus, the Lizardmen can play like the exact same way. Empire can bring Outriders, Pistoliers, and War Wagons. And the Lizardmen can bring Razor Dawn Hunting Packs, Salamanders, Ancient Salamanders. And they could just have like this haggard, like, kiting skirmish fight, which is going to be really interesting. But I, I already think that Lizardmen have a really good style of play in using some of these big things. Like, you know, Salamanders and having kiting and just picking your opponent apart with like some of your mobile units. But uh, man, yeah. <laughs> Falcon says, Sacred Croc Scores will show this Chaos from your creatures who are the real anti-large in this game. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Uh, Amex on Barbs, dealing poison damage and heavily scaled for enhanced missile resistance. So pretty, depending on how good the missile resist is, these guys could have a niche application against like some of these missile factions. Uh, pinpoint shooters and top-notch skirmishers. All right, guys, so now we've officially gone over everything. I think it's time we jump into uh, some battles here as I sweat profusely here in this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this hot room. Let's go ahead and do it to it. We're going to fire up Total War Warhammer. Man, that the war, I'm so excited for the War Wagons. You guys, uh, I'm sure you guys all have that same excitement. Yeah. Yeah, tic-tac-toe, mass, like, Razor Dawn pack with Salamanders. Like, So what you would do in a build like that is you would bring, like, a ton of Salamanders. You would bring the Ancient Salamander. You'd bring the Razor Dawns, which covers all your bases. And then you bring a bunch of, like, Horned Ones mixed in with, like, a powerful Punch Lord. So then, like, when they try and catch you, you kill them, and then you just kill the rest of their army once you deal with their mobility, which is going to be crazy. Norska, Chaos, and Beastmen have just been boned. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's going to be harder for them. It just went black because I'm switching to uh, Total War Warhammer, darling. I'm firing up the game. So we're going to do some... We, we did talk about the Electric Count system. We did. We talked about that earlier. All right, so let's do this to this. Do this to this. Warmer takes a little bit of time to fire up here. All right, so we got the game up. I think it should be showing now, which is good. And in Discord, I was sent a... Uh... All right, I'll take a look at that. Oh, man. All right, guys. Let's do it to it. Warhammer. We're going to just play some battles for fun now that we have, you know, 500 people here. Why not, right? So I was going to play, uh, you can get Arrow or Falcon, either one of those guys, if you guys want to see some, some fierce cockfights. Arrow Classic uh, said he would be free, so we'll see if he's around right now. All right, so I'm going to play Arrow Classic real quick. We'll play a couple games. Maybe we'll jump Falcon in there if you want to. If you're still up, I know in Russia it must be like, so seven plus three. Oh man, it's like 3 a.m. in Russia right now. Yeah, so Alex Hughes, I mean, I think it's going to be an extremely fun DLC. Like, I'm really, really excited for that. Man, it's going to be so good and tasty. Oh, man. Oh, man. So let me go ahead and find. So as soon as I get more details, like more information, and, uh, you know, typically Creative Assembly does give us early access to these type of things, you know, I'll be, I'll be going deep. I'll be going deep. Uh, when it's released, can you please scale up the Dread Saurian in the lab? <laughs> yeah, dude, sure. <laughs> Do, like, a huge battle. Oh, that'd be... You know, normally I'm not a fan of such type of, like, game formats, but... For that... There he is. All right. I know it takes you back to the quick battle days. Well, you see, the thing is, is, like, we already had, like... It's almost 3 a.m. in Germany. Russia's, like, 5 a.m. Damn. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool, Void. Yeah, I see that. I see that. <laughs> oh my god, Void, that's awesome. Here, let me show you guys a picture real quick. Okay. 
flying tacos in here spectating. All right, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, I see it all void. Hang on a sec. Let me let me pull it up and uh, I'll show people on stream here while we wait for Arrow to fire up his game. Hold on. I'm just going through all these images here on my desktop. I'm, my desktop is like so haggard and unorganized. Yeah, see, check it out, guys. So he just sent me this this car. Look at the license plate on the car. <laughs> if only you did. It'd be really funny if that was just for my channel, but look at that. So it's Turin. It's pretty cool, man. All right, we got Arrow. So I'm going to go with... Uh, what do we want to play today? Let's do some... Uh, let's do some High Elves. I don't play Elves often. I know everyone's like, you only play Averlorn, but today we'll play. We'll play some factions I don't normally play. All right, I returned, my friends. And I actually do have a Helm and Gorse replay coming up pretty soon here, so you guys will get to see that in all its glory. Um, Shimmer Sword. Let's do Oaken Hammer. Oaken Hammer is a classic. Yeah. No, it's in a crash. We're good, guys. Thank you guys so much for joining today, by the way. I know that hour is a little bit weird. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Arrow, you want to voice chat? I'll see if Arrow Krasik wants to come on. We can get some of his thoughts. I'm glad I'm glad to hear you survived that. All right, guys, so we're going to get Arrow Krasik here, one of the ever-chosen and certainly one of the better players out there. And uh, we're going to play some quick battles, have some fun, and uh, we'll do it. A map this small will be a struggle for Hiles. OK. Uh, you're probably right. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll change the map. Sure, sure. <laughs> do the, the crossroads. You can do Iron Sand, Iron Sand Desert, it's fine. All right, guys, let us know how the quality sounds. What's up, man? The air was hot from summer, and you say we're just friends, but friends don't know the way you taste, la la la. That's it's 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 a signature of Aerocrastic to uh to sing a ballad whenever we begin. Well What's you probably up? do that with all your friends, right? It's not just me. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm I'm not uh I'm not being biased towards anyone, of course. No, that's that's fair play. It's fair play, man. So what do you think about the new uh have you gotten a chance to look at the trailers and all the new units yeah, and that stuff? I, I took a glance at it. Um I mean honestly I, I do think it'll make the at least Empire specifically, I think it'll make their gameplay a lot more dynamic. Because right now, you know, generally speaking, most of the options that they have are kind of based off of, uh, what's it called? Based off of Demigriff Knights as kind of an <laughs> yeah. anchor unit. And then, yeah, like a Demi Hammer with like Karl Franz or gooning out the enemy lords. And... Yeah, Demi Hammer or you shoot it to pieces, right? Yeah, yeah, it's... Dude, the war wagons. So they have they have the outrider variant essentially, which has hand gunners. They have the the mobile mortar, and then they also have the regiment of renown, which has a hellblaster volley gun. So there's three of them. Yeah, there. I think all three of them are going to be quite obnoxious. 
it's going to be really great. Yes. It'll, it'll be really something. I mean, Empire kite builds are already pretty decent, depending on the faction you take them against. But yeah, um, all right, I think the options are going to definitely open up quite a bit. Um, we, we still have to see how much they cost, of course. But yeah. <laughs> oh, and it brought Wookie. The camera's off right now, so. Ah, that's that's a shame. We'll show we'll show him before the stream's over. We'll close it out. Wookie says bye. And Anthony, thank you for the donation, man. I did see that. I just set up Streamlabs because I'm using a different window. So thanks, darling. <clears throat> thank you so much for the donation. So you want to play Norska, huh? Yeah. Uh, or I can pick something else. I don't know. What is no, no. I, I, just a disclaimer. I'm I'm not the best with high elves, so you know I'll still give it my all, of course. But uh, you know. Yeah. So Norsk is fine. Just you, you do your your Norskins over there. All right. The filthy barbarians. I'll just I'll be angry and half naked. That's great. Um, not not much too, not much unlike how I usually play, just minus the angry part. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's the life, man. And by the way, uh, guys, if you haven't seen Aerocrastic's YouTube channel, he he does uh, tournaments, live videos, all kinds of good stuff. So we'll drop a link before the stream's over. Uh, let's see here. Let us see. What will we do against you? Have you seen the... the? I don't know if it's a bug, but with the Flamespire Phoenix, when it dies and it just instant nukes something, have you had that happen to you? Yeah, it's been like that for a while, actually. The last time I saw it do something relevant was a couple months ago in one of these... in a tournament that I think was hosted by V Claw. Okay. Um, it was like one of the semifinals matches, and some guy's Flamespire Phoenix blew up a Star Dragon. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems pretty bugged, man. You know? Yeah. Oh, man. Which is which is pretty funny, but definitely unfortunate. All right, so we got... Oh, sorry, not, not a Star Dragon. It was a Bastilladon. I saw Carl Franz get one-shotted by one. Yeah, he just got, like, popped. Oh. Yeah, that, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely does. Oh, man. Thinking about the build here. Let's get you guys. Yeah. I'm going to take... I'm going to take a fun unit. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have some weird units in my army too, so you'll you'll be in good company. All right, sounds good. That's good, that's good, that's good. The foul Norskin hordes, they come. Oh, they're coming for you, all right. Oh no, man, I'm scared. Get you guys and you guys. Cool. I think I'm ready. I think it'll do, pig. It'll do, pig, it'll do. So, uh, Daniel, to answer your question as to why I'm not using the, uh, um, you know, I shouldn't give him this information, but I'm not using the Flamespire Phoenix because it, it is bugged occasionally. And sometimes when it dies, it instant kills like whatever's next to it. So the reason I'm not doing that is because I don't want to like cheese his Lord or any of his characters or anything like that. So yeah, hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question. All right, cool, man. I'm ready when you are. All right, let's do it. Let's do it, do it. The Iron Sand Desert calls. Here we go. But yeah, I think, like, did you see all of Nakai's buffs that he has? Have you read through the, uh, the, the, like, stat, the stat kind of description in the, uh, the Steam page? I haven't seen all of them, although I remember some people were clamoring about some sort of a immune to psychology aura or something. Yeah, no, or no, perfect, immune to vigor. Perfect vigor. Yeah. He lowers yeah. leadership and melee attack of nearby enemies. And, uh, or no, he lowers leadership of nearby enemies. Probably by like four or six, I would imagine. Pretty standard there. But he also yeah. has like a Madness of Cain type ability. So he rampages nearby lizards and gives them physical resist and melee attack, which I think is pretty good for like just your source front line and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, that's pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So, I mean, yeah, if, if he does follow like that sort of buffing, debuffing play style, um, I guess it depends on like his stat line also. But I, I think he'll definitely be competitive with the source old blood right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't know if they gave any details of the other uh, the other lad yet. The uh, freaking the uh, the free LC guy. Let's see. Yeah, I guess we may have to wait and see for that one. Let's get some of these these guys up here, up here. I don't know if we need to go that wide, really. Let's go a little bit more narrow. Yeah, high elves are one of my factions I really want to improve on because I feel like you know a lot of people dump on high elves and say they're bad, but I feel like they're really good, at, like in the hands of a specialist who knows how to use them. Yeah, they have they have a lot of potential. So the kind of the, the shtick with high elves is that um, they have a lot of very even matchups, and that's kind of their strength. Like be, because of that, you know, they're not considered one of the top tier factions because they don't really they have don't have counter. like aside from Bretonia. I mean, I think Bretonia is kind of a bad matchup for them. Um, yeah, but like aside from that, I don't think they have too many bad matchups, right? 
Yeah, it's, I mean, maybe like slightly disfavored, but everything is definitely within the realm of winnable. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I concur, my friend. Let's get you guys hanging out back here. I can't handle all these hot groups! Guess we gotta call King of the Dead over here. I know, King of the Dead would be like, hot groups? Who needs those? Easy. He's so good considering he doesn't use them too, that's like the real impressive thing. Yeah, he told me he got used to it after playing a bunch of Rome too. And like in, in the older Total Wars, um, like the whole grouping system was really clunky, so I didn't use it either, but yeah, he just takes it to a new level. Falcon in chat says Nakai would be an auto include. He probably is going to replace Soros Old Bloods. Probably, I mean, obviously he's going to be a Foot Lord, but he'll be like Throg in terms of like mass and presence and everything. So, it's good. Yeah. All right, I'm ready when you are. All right, let's do it. You ready for the, the Wrath of the, the High Elves? Let's go. All right, so let's do, let's do a little bit of this. Are you guys coming over here? Oh, you got some big old thick mammoths, huh? Oh, yeah. Is it Wolfric? Oh, it's Marauder Chieftain, okay. Nope. We've got the uh, classic Chieftain guy with his little axe. Should've <laughs> probably should have taken the Firecaster. It would have given me some synergy with the uh, fire attacks, but... I wouldn't uh, call it. I wouldn't call his, his anything of his little. Certainly seems pretty well, strong. Yeah. Look at that thing. All right, so let's get a little little pressure in there in the flankeroos. All right, that was a nice early charge. Yeah, not bad. You got all kinds of big scary monsters though, so it's gonna be hard to. Yeah, I don't know if my build has like the kind of the, the girth to deal with like all your threats. Uh, it might. We'll have to see. The Fireborn are usually pretty meaty, so... Yeah, they're really good. You know, on those guys is really strong. Oh. Teclos, get away from those Berserkers! Throwers need to stop. Start shooting some new targets here. Yeah, it's getting a little messy back here for sure. That's a nice terror route. Okay, I guess it kind of goofy plays there. You made some what? Some goofy plays? Alright, so it was a nice terror route, but it kind of went both ways there. Yeah, yeah, it did. We got rid of the Buna guy, which is good. Yeah. But the Berserkers in the back line here is going to be a little bit messy. Yeah, definitely a little bit of an issue for sure. Javelins are coming back online. Let's get the archers in. Net some of these guys down a little bit. Yep. Nice catch with the uh, Premier and the Spearman. Yeah, I still don't think I have enough stopping power here. Yeah, things just kind of broke down a little too quickly. Well, I didn't have enough mass, I think. I, I probably needed, like, some Silver Helms or something to, like... Have to yeah. Bring, I have to bring my bird back. Let's pull you guys over I here. think a dragon would have also been really nice here, just kind of, like, using breath attacks to help bust up the Tamir. And yeah, I've never that, been really good with, with the breath attacks. Something I need to improve on. And I don't know, what do you think of the, uh, the Bolt Thrower pick? I, I've seen them do pretty well. Um, if, if you can fix them onto, like, uh... A, a mammoth, or or if uh, Norska decides to opt for like a caster uh, chariot, then it's also a pretty good. Mm, yeah, uh, that, pretty that's good a really good point. Focus. Yeah, I think for techless though, definitely you need more synergy with like a wider archer line. Yeah, with more firepower for sure. Yeah. All right, let's let's get some some evil techless action in. Get back, I'll fly, you fools. It's a pigeon chasing Famir, chasing archers, which is being chased by a chieftain. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's like, it's Inception here. Uh, I'm not Hold sure, me. Robert King. Yeah, to answer your question. Alright, so that's looking pretty grim bones there. I mean, we've done some damage. Killing the caster was good. 
But yeah, the bolt throwers is like you're just dead weight now. Yeah. The flame spire, the, the frostbird seems okay. Yeah, I think you definitely could have gotten more aggressive with that earlier. Yeah, I just wanted to snipe your deathcaster to prevent, which we did, but it didn't seem to accomplish a whole lot. Probably should yeah, have just. He, he got, he got off of Duna in his last moments. Yeah, yeah, like, he got it. GG, man. That was a good one. GG? No, no, Raz. There's no coming back from that. There's there's too many too many units. The chariots are really good, too. Those things are just nasty, nasty. Foul beasts. All right, so this match, I will play... Who do I want to mess around with here? Could do Tomb Kings. Uh, let's... Yeah, I'll just try coast. Screw it. I need. I, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna right. try something new out here, a new build, depending right. on what you play. Uh, let me throw a Bretonia at you. For the lady. This matchup, I feel like, used to be uh, just horrible for Bretonia pre-nerf. Like, uh, or I mean, before the Vampire Coast had its uh, summons nerfed really bad. Yeah. But I feel like it's gotten a lot better for them now. Like, I've actually had trouble winning this from Vampire Coast perspective, but. Yeah, Bretonia, so, so something I think that uh, people kind of, I, I guess, uh, underrate is that Bretonian infantry is not actually that bad. So no, they're, I mean, like, foot squires, battle pilgrims, things like that. Yeah, yeah. so, like, as soon as you go up into, the, like, the battle pilgrim range, you have infantry that will beat basically everything short of Death Guard, and then, you know, when it comes to armor piercing and things like that, you have support for lords, magic. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of tools that are really easily accessible. And I mean, you know, people always make the claim that, oh, well, you know, if I take Elite Knights, they'll just get hammered by a Necrofex or something. But the thing is, like, you know, Coast doesn't really have many ways of damaging those Elite Knights outside of, you know, like, dragging them down through, uh, through halberds which are stationary or shooting them. So, like, yeah, sure, you can lose half a Knight on the way in because the other half that's still alive is, like, impossible for Coast to kill, right? Yeah, yeah. It is, my friend. You guys want bloated corpses? Come on. I want to put up a fight here. <laughs> I don't want to give them 500 gold for free. <laughs> you know? Shit. Oh, chat, chat loves their bloated corpses. Who doesn't, man? Who doesn't love them bloated boys? They're just so bad. They Maybe. are. I feel like they could be really good if they were like, I don't know, 400 or 300. Yeah, you know, some, somewhere in that range. Like 200? <laughs> Now, yeah. we're get, now we're getting maybe a little bit too cheap, right? But yeah, but, like what I envision them being is that um, so so assuming that Vampire Coast opts for like more of a long range, um, a long range missile build with like more carronades and more deck gunners and things like that. It's also obviously a little bit more fragile in melee once you're close to distance. Sure. So you know when they get in with those like dark riders or whatever, you just slam a bloated corpse into it to get rid of it, <laughs> right? Like that, that's how I envision it. That, that's the dream, but yeah, it rarely becomes a reality, unfortunately. Yeah. <sighs> don't really need that. I don't know how this build's going to work. It's a little bit funky, but I think it has, I think it has some teeth. Yeah, we will, we will see. You guys want crabs? I mean, the Bretonia, the crabs are quite good against these guys, for sure. They are. Yeah, I think the Lampreys of Revenge can be pretty good. As like a roadblock, you know, just powerhouse unit. Yep. I mean, even if uh, Bretonia does bring the AP to deal with them, there's there's a lot of counterplay on both sides there. Yeah, they still take frickin' forever to kill. Yeah. So let's cut. Hmm. This build is so... so strange. I don't know if it'll work. Well, I guess the we'll... way to find out is to just go for it. Let's just go for it. Alright. I'm sure you'll have enough AP to deal with it. <laughs> you guys want me to bring the Dread Sorian? I don't know if that's possible, but, you know, we'll, tr we'll try. Oh my god, this is going to be ridiculous. All right, let's see. Yeah, I think typical Vampire Coast, there's... Yeah. I actually do like Morngulls in this matchup as well. I'm pretty good at cleaving through hordes of infantry. They have enough mass to block up knights. Mm. Yeah, maybe they're better than Death Guard. It's hard to say. What, are you a fan of the uh, Morngulls in this matchup? Or you feel like they're too vulnerable to the Peasant Archers? Um, I mean, in general, I think they're just a little bit too squishy. Like, you know, dealing with infantry is nice, but from yeah. Bretonia, you're always Yeah, when they, lo when they lost Terror, too, that was really big. Because that was something that made them just such powerhouse units. 
Because yeah, because they they were able to basically just push off any beat up units, and they could actually fight some units of like cavalry or other things like that just by getting the terror out off. Yeah. Um, so now you have to be a little bit more methodical about you know where you place them. And, you know, I think generally speaking, they need they need a lot of support, um, but they definitely shine when you give it to them. Yeah, yeah. I've had success with them for sure. I think Vampire Coast is like a top tier faction. Yeah. I think they're bad matchups over like uh, like bow factions. I always feel like that's kind of hard. Like like good bow play and battlefield control is really tough for them to handle in my my personal experience. Yeah. Um, I, I think the Wood Elves and High Elves in particular can be a little bit tricky for them. Yeah, you really um, have to go, have good mortar play and good uh, scurvy dog play. Yeah. And then aside from that, I would say Dwarves. Um, yeah, Dwarves are really good against them too, I think. Pretty much for your name. Yep. Dwarves definitely know how to give the dirty to the uh, to the lads. You ready for Luther Harkin? Oh, oh boy! <laughs> or, Maybe or, not. Or is it the great scheme? Let's get you guys here. You guys. And you guys. Yeah, I think the nerfs to Vampire Coast were pretty warranted, though, for sure. Yeah, they they released in a pretty outrageous state. Um, oh my god! Remember in the Ever Chosen, like when Death Guard could kill like like five thousand oh gold worth of stuff in their own. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I hated those so much. As a matter of fact, so much I took a mammoth. <laughs> yeah, I remember you you won that. Yeah, that was against Indy Pride, I think. Yeah, gosh, those ah, oh, early Death Guard gives me conniptions just thinking about them. I know, just just haunts us. All right, so you over here. All right, I'm ready, dude. All right, let's do it. Let the games begin. Let's see if my, my wild card pick here is going to be good. All right, let's see it. Did you did you know it would be it would be her? Uh, that Arnessa? Oh, it is. It is. Oh, and, and Queen Bess. Oh, hello. Things are getting pretty wild here. I don't know though, we'll see. Be careful. Let's see what do we have there? Zombie pirate gunnery mob. <laughs> Yar. Not too much high mass is my only concern for this build, but uh Oh! Oh yeah, give me those peasant archers. Oh I guessed wrong. Crap. <laughs> Here comes round two. This one's on the other ones, I think. Oh no, my knights are in the way. Zombie. Dude, the value train is quite real here, huh? Yeah, you know what? I am going to earth flip that. A little premature, maybe, but... Oh, those those vesting knights are definitely done for. Yeah, we got the uh, we got the the fisherman's net on him, which is pretty good. Oh man, I just totally forgot about some of those doggies. Oh. Uh -oh. Ah, goodbye archers. Oof. Yeah, Ernest's little goon squad is pretty good actually. Yeah, she's she's got it. Oh baby, she's got it. Those freaking cannon blasts are just insane. Yeah, I'm doing quite a bit of work right now. Let's see, I need to figure out where all my knights are. Uh, yeah, you guys, you guys move. Really nice dog play. Yeah, I forgot about one of them, but the other dog is, is doing good work. So that's 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 good. See. I don't know if we can afford to keep fighting out here. Otherwise Queen Bessie will just shell us to death probably. Ye old Bessie. Oh! Oh, that hurts. Dude, Bess is hammering the shit out of your army here. Oh yeah. Battle Pilgrims are in business. Oh, 
don't think I can afford to blob up on that right now. Otherwise, we'll uh, be feeling the consequences of that for sure. The thing about this old Bessie is I got some extra powder. Uh oh. Aaron, I said the, the spear fishery package. package. Oh, Bess is just doing the work. Oh man, that hurts. I am happy I brought that for sure. This is a hard blob to win though. With Aaronessa giving everything bonus for his large nearby. Yeah, um, I might, I'm probably gonna have to hope I can snipe her out with like cycle charging or some other you know, persistent source of damage like that. Ooh. Yeah, absolutely. This pains my soul. Oh, it's fine, dude. I respect that. All right, Spassy. She's pretty. She's pretty resilient, though. Hopefully, she'll be able to survive this. Yeah. I mean, the Death Guard are holding pretty nicely around her, I think. Um. Yeah. Just need to crumble all of the support away, and then maybe. See what schemes you got. So hot for us. Midnight Raider. And then also the Gunnery White with his little peppering ammo is, is doing pretty good. Yeah. Getting some work done, that's for sure. Alright, come on, Aradessa. Let's see some damage on you. It's not happening, she's got the luck of Manon. Ah. Uh. That's why we should have brought Alberic. I know Alberic would have. You would have had something to say about that. Okay, we should probably stop shooting into our our blob here. <laughs> the Queen Bess collateral damage is brutal. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Look at that. Two sixteen kills. Yeah, that thing just just cleaned up shop today, man. GG. GG. That was a crazy one. Oh my goodness. ASD, one, two, three. Yeah, it's like any replays I cast now, you know, now that everyone knows the DLC is like up close, is like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. GG, man, that was that was a Bessie show for sure. Oh, but yeah. Heroness is really good too against Bretonia with the Nets. Like, yeah. you, Nets, Nets. bonus for his large depth guard that aren't the Halberd variant, it's really, really strong. Yeah. Actually, her net also drops melee defense, right? Yeah, it lowers melee defense too, so they just get shocked even worse. Yeah. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks for playing again, man. Of course. Let's do the old short off, so. <laughs> All right. So, I'll play, uh, I will play. What do you guys want to see? <laughs> Queen, ba Queen Bass would have ran out of ammo, but the Gunnery White was helping, for sure. If you guys are in chat or wondering. That's how it was keeping its ammo going. Yeah, the hounds yeah. had a ton of kills too. Uh, let's play, let's play, let's play. I could do the green skins. All right. The green skins, the tide comes. Well, I will... <sighs> hmm. I'll give you some dwarves. The Daiwei. Dwarves, huh? Dwarves. Oh man. All right, things are things are heating up here. Matter of fact, actually, I'm gonna go with Angrand dwarves. We're doing a wa, guys. Oh no, the 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 holy the holy spirits are they coming? Is that just something Father. I have to worry about now? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Maybe. <laughs> Father, Son, and the Holy Dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well that's fine. That's fine. I feel like this is just so hard for the dwarves. It can be a bit of a challenge, but you think it's pretty. You think it's doable, though. I think it's doable. Yeah. No, oh, I'm sure people here, people will appreciate seeing that. Uh... The classic showdown, guys. Skarsnik. Oh God, Skarsnik is so haggard. I mean, I don't know. Do you think there's any matchups in which Skarsnik is like viable competitively? Probably not, right? Compared to like Warzog and Azag. Uh. 
I, I mean, I, I guess he is a style choice against, like, Beastman, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's just rough. Like, his biggest drawback is actually the fact that he doesn't have immunity to psychological effects. Yeah, he so just like gets his, routed off, yeah. yeah his, his HP bar is deceptively high. <laughs> we'll just yeah, he's that. got, like, almost 5k HP. He's got, like, 1,000 more HP than Grimoire. Yeah, but uh, he only gets to use, like, 3,000 of it, Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. He does have insane amounts of mass, though. Falcon, thanks for the heads up on that. Yeah, the freaking... Uh, I always forget about that. God, it's so expensive, too. All right, um, let me get that. No, probably keep that actually. Um, so we got that. We got you guys. We got some of this. Got some shanks and fun times for all. <laughs> you guys want twelve work board boys? I don't know if that's going to be worth it, to be frank. Hmm. Ah. Oh. I could play like how Slade plays and just bring all squigs and trolls. <laughs> it is an option for sure. Yeah, but um, I mean, typically there's going to be some slayers, I think, so. Yeah. Either quite a few slayers or or other things. Yeah, yeah. Just foul, foul threats to the, to the goblin people. Probably cut that. You know what? Let's just throw one of those in for good measure. All right, I'm ready if you are. Uh, making some last decisions. Do the ancestors call? They might. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it, man. They might. <laughs> and Felcon, if you're not too tired, we could easily get you in for a game too, man. I know it's like literally like 6 a.m. there in Russia or 5 a.m., so you probably haven't slept. Okay. Let's do it to it. Let's go. But man, yeah, Warhammer really needed a breath of life for sure. With, like some new DLC. Yeah. I was I was getting a little parched. Uh Daedric Cat, it's strudel time. Thank you for the donation, man. And could some of the mods in chat, if there's any mods still here, uh could you guys drop a link to Aerocrassic's channel so you guys can find him? Then maybe uh for future streams we can both stream and you can see both perspectives if we have showdowns and whatnot. You're still awake, Falcon, alright. We'll get you. We'll get you in for the next game. You down to have him play the winner between us here? Uh, yeah, sure. Cool, cool. Probably got a couple more games left on stream, guys. Like three or four. If I if I lose this, I'll cast and uh, we can go from there. Dude, the queen best wild card. So crazy. Yeah. Like that's not like a common thing you'd see, right? But against peasant archers, it's so good. Yeah, and it's also really quite hard for Bretonia to compromise because they don't have any sort of like magic missiles or anything like that. So. Yeah, you can just sit back there with like your freaking halberds and just, you know, enjoy the sunset. Yeah, yeah. As long as you zone uh, the Bretonian pressure out, then it definitely would be quite a challenge. It's actually really funny. Like, if you've ever looked at the the crew for Queen Bess, it is massive. Like, yeah. Oh, they have they have a whole crew. I mean, you know, it's pirates and all that. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're having a new ever chosen here. People are saying. Yeah, with you and you and Falcon battling. <laughs> Alright, let's get Alright, so let's go do this. Four and five. A little bit of love from that. Alright. The the lads are ready, man. How big is your army? Okay, so you're not going with a box. Nope. We don't do boxes here. Well, I know the dwarf the dwarf boxes are so haggard. It's just it's just the. <laughs> it, I, mean, I feel like work, it like teaches but... you. It, it like, it teaches you bad form. You know, it's like if you're first learning how to like fight, and they teach you how to like throw a punch wrong. It's like super hard to unlearn it. You know. Yeah. And I feel like that's yeah. what dwarf boxing is. It's like it seems easy, and like it's, it seems like a, a way to get quick wins on ladder, but against like good players, it's just not going to work. It, it almost never works. I think. Well, you can kind of get away with it against like vampire counts, but they're actually yeah. kind of weak to boxing in general. Yeah, I still think it's just. All right, ready when you are. All right, let's do it. Do the ancestors call? Do they call yet? We'll find out here. It would seem I have the artillery advantage. Uh, that you do. Oh my god, a gyrocopter. Let's 
Let's see what you got. So nasty skulkers. I, I, I now suddenly wish I had brought like just ten black orcs or something. Oh yeah. Black orcs taking a bit of a proper pound in there. Yep, they're getting flamed on a little, for sure. See some miners off to the side getting feasted on a bit. Can't be helped, I guess. Yeah, you can't win them all. Freaking flamethrower of the gods there, dude. Yeah. Should Actually quite good against green skin, surprisingly. Like even even against the slightly more armored units. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean I this is a this is a treat seeing a build like this. I have to find my way in somehow. Run, Wurzog, run. It's getting poked down a little. Skulkers! Oh shit, I forgot about my chariots this whole time. Uh-oh. <laughs> God, that would have been so good. Those would have definitely helped a lot here, yeah. It's okay, we're still we're still going strong, guys. It's still a close game. You know what? In the chariots, it's it's actually a, a tactical reserve here, so. Oh yeah. I did that on purpose. Yes. those guys in there. Start having some fun. Whatever. So this little rock lover too doing some work. Yeah, he's getting in there. Goblin Wolf Trade's doing some decent work. Yeah. Really nice disruption. Good, you have Slayers now. You don't you didn't even bring any Slayers really, huh? Nope. All shooty. I feel like the Orc Archer line's pretty good too. Yeah, it uh puts a lot of pressure on me. Um Goblin Wolf Chariots that could. Yeah, they're, they're getting through it. Got a little bit of a pocket here, but uh, I don't know, it looks like we're faltering in front of that little archer line. Yeah, they're doing really good. You got like, some of these guys. Get through there, lads. Push it. They do it. Trigger the Bonewood Staff. Got my squigs. Yeah, I feel like that's just so hard for dwarves. Uh, well, it is build dependent a bit. Um, yeah. You, I remember we played a game a couple months ago, and you used the uh, the flamethrowers to pretty good effect against me. Yeah. Like I, I have like yeah. I have, I'm having like just flashbacks of that. Yeah. So like, if you go a little bit more goblin heavy. Um, or even in view of the archer line, perhaps. Uh, Flamethrowers would have done quite a bit of work. Hmm. Uh, I think my Iron Drakes actually died to your archers predominantly. This yeah, time. one of my archers was, or I had 
heavy focus fire on the one group for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, so the persistent fire kind of pulling them off of my... Uh, well, pulling them out of my gun line. Um, basically removed some of the morale shock I had for, like, breaking off your chariots quickly. Hmm, yeah. And then from there, it kind of went in. Because as you can see, like, well, yeah, like, right now you're kind of running low on ammo, and we're hitting a point in the game where it's basically a bit of a grind out, right? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. We still have... Uh, but I I'm starting to lack, like, some of my major AP tools and... Um, yeah, and there's still Black Orcs fighting, too. Yeah. I don't know if giving the Fist of Gork is worth it, but I just brought it in case you brought the Ghost Daddies. Oh, yeah. Because, like, you know, I don't want to deal with some ethereal terror-causing unit and just not be able to kill it. Right, right. These guys, if we can, bring you guys back in. And Orc, orc Airboys aren't slouches in combat, too. They can definitely fight things like Torporters and stuff. Yeah, they, they, they can scrap, for sure. All right, we're coming in. Pull back. Ooh, the dwarf warriors. Hey, you still have a bunch of longbeards in there, actually. Yeah, longbeards are holding firm. Forty-one of them. We can get rid of the chariot, then maybe. Well, something that's tricky too is I still have an artillery piece. Yeah. So I can kind of just like pull back a little bit. Yep. We're gonna have to get on top of that somehow. A little crossfire action, let's get some squigs back in here. What is that, a Dwarf Lord? Oh, it's a Rune Lord, okay. That's a Rune Lord. Come on, squigs! Fight you pigs! Fight you gits! Come on, slap that pork! <laughs> the, Rune Lord actually could, the Rune Lord actually could slap the pork, too. I'm not careful. He could, yeah. Do you have any other dwarves in the distance coming back? Not really. I'll pull you back a little bit. It's gonna be it's gonna be a grindy one here. Yeah. I think that's. I think you're just gonna get army lost though. Yeah. Yep. Green Lord probably can't fight it out all that on his own. Yeah, especially maybe a Thorger might be able to like a Lord like that. Yeah. But the Rune Lord is I still think the best pick. Like Rune of Wrath and Rune is so good against like Black Orcs and things like that. Yeah, it really helped me burst down the first group. Oh my god, dude, they got shrekt. Yeah, the flamethrower thing is interesting. Like, you would think it would be terrible against armor, but the leadership thing on greenskins, I suppose, isn't bad. It's just a lot to protect, you know? That's the only downside. Yeah. Since the Doom Diver buff, um, taking units like that has gotten a little bit more risky, but... Yeah. Um, you know, it, sometimes you just have to kind of throw something out there and, and uh, best. Do you have that, that first replay we, we played, by the way? The High Elf game? Uh, no, I don't. I think I still, I think I, I saved it. I just wanted to double check. Okay. All right, so if you want, we could have you battle Falcon just to spare my hand if you're down. But if, if you need to go or something, I mean, it feels okay, so I'll probably be fine. Because I know, I know you, it's probably pretty late where you are. Well, it's only 8.30, so I, I got time. You're down? Okay, cool. Yeah. So Falcon, if you want to join a battle aerocrastic, I'm just going to jump out to spare my hand. GG's, man. And, yeah, GG. Uh, Let's see here, so let me open another spectator slot. I'll be right back. Arrow Falcon. Gotta find the game now. Should still be there. Can't even remember my own password. <laughs> oh shit, there's a space in it. So Falcon, if you're up for a 5 a.m. game, what the hell is the password? Huh, is there a capital or something? Oh, I think I might have had caps lock on. Oh. Uh, We're good. We're good. I'm good. Fine. Yeah. Oh, he's here. He's ready. Flying tacos in here watching, too. All right. Uh, let's see. What map should we have? Anything you want, man. And we can let's just see. hang. We can even just hang out and chat. Or actually, yeah, I'll just jump out and do some commentary and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, thanks. Right. Thanks again, man, for the games. And uh, yeah, we'll make sure to check out Arrow's channel. You have any anything you'd like to tell people about your channel? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, my, my schedule is a, a little bit busy right now because of, you know, work and all that getting my career started, but, um, for sure I'll, I'll be sure to stream, you know, at least once a week and, uh, I should be getting back into producing videos again probably sometime within the next month. Yeah. So. Right on, man. Your channel's, your channel's just Aerocrastic, right? There's no QSA in front? 
Yeah, just Eric Preston. As the name spelled, guys. And uh, we'll drop a link, of course, and good luck in your game with Felcon here. Thanks. See you, brother. All right, guys. So sincere thanks to uh, to, Fel uh, to Aerocrastic for playing some games with me. Hopefully you guys got to enjoy. Man, I, I really think that Greenskins have a huge advantage in that matchup. Like, I forgot my chariots for, you know, a good portion of that battle, and we still were able to win. But, um, yeah, it's 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 a tough one for the Dowie. So, yeah, we're going to have a, a little couple games between Falcon and Arrow here to close out the stream. And uh, we'll probably do, like, one or two games. We'll see what they bring. Got some fun updates, though, regarding community stuff, guys. We, uh... I'm working on, I'm going to be working with Anna, my lovely wife, on uh, some fun stuff for the community. So we're going to be doing a, a website for Total War. So essentially it's going to be like a total, it'll be like for other games I play too, but mainly it's going to be focused on Total War and the esports behind it. And uh, we're going to be doing like a Total War esports website where players who want to get involved in community tournaments and things like that, they can actually go and uh, find tournaments to play in. Uh, there's going to be potentially like articles written by people who are in the community and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So, uh, so Case Corona, thank you for the donation. You're you're here at the very end of the stream. So we talked about all the new DLC stuff. I played three battles versus Aerocrastic, and now we're going to close out with Felcon and Aerocrastic playing a game. So yeah, it's been a really fun kind of just miscellaneous stream, just having a good time. And uh, yeah. That's that. It's fun. But yeah, as far as the DLC goes, uh, I think that Nakai is going to be an absolute monster. He has he has really, really good buffs. Uh, he buffs leadership of nearby troops, or lowers leadership of nearby troops, buffs melee attack and physical resistance of nearby allies. And on top of that, he has one more really good ability. I forget what it is. Um, God. Oh, perfect vigor for everyone near him, which is like one of the most underrated, powerful things in the entire game. So, uh, so that's really, really good. On top of that, I think that for the Empire... The Huntsmen are going to have some decent niche applications. Anti-large archers are good, but the War Wagons are probably going to be the coolest units. And War Wagons are going to open up a style of play for the Empire that's very diverse. And I think that the Empire has a very stagnant style of play now. It's usually like Aerocrastic and I were discussing. They're very reliant on using like Demogriff Knights and just, just hammer goon squads like that. So um, I think that it's going to be a fun DLC. The campaigns look awesome. I'm personally going to play the Empire campaign as soon as uh, I'm allowed to, you know, or as soon as I get access and I'm allowed to show you guys. Uh, I will 100% play the Empire campaign. That's going to be my jam because I think it sounds really fun. And uh, yeah, that's kind of just a summary. Hopefully that is good. But if any of you guys want, you can go back and check it out. Uh, we had about a 30, 40 minute discussion on all the new content in the stream. So I was a little a little ways back, but yeah. In chapter, I played a couple games against uh, Arrow. We played three games and, you know, I decided to rest my hand after that. So, um, so yeah, I could still have the rest of my night be, uh, be good and everything. So... Life's good, my friends. Thank you guys so much for joining today. DLC needs more Doom Wheels, says Romulan Dog. Yeah. So in this matchup, we have Felcon facing off against Arrow, and it's going to be uh, Lizardmen versus Tomb King. So Felcon continuing to build a hype for the uh, for the for the cold-blooded folk over there. Do you think you could make a build with Terror Geist with Vampire Counts? Oh, Kyle, for sure. Terror Geist are one of the best units on the entire roster. They're very very good. So I mean, most competitive builds, not most, but a lot of them do include them. So. <laughs> War wagons are so cool. I just wish I had it right now so I could show all you guys. You know, I was like, oh, I wish I wish the DLC was here so we could just play it and enjoy ourselves. But Gonna have a ton of replays over the course of the next week. As a matter of fact, I have another one coming at 10 o'clock tonight. So there will be one coming up at 10. Um, yeah, well, it's just a lot of content coming, guys. To, to kind of tide you guys over until the uh, the glorious DLC drops. Uh, Turn, do you evaluate 40k list? I would. You know, if somebody sent me a list in Discord, I would evaluate it for you, yeah. Uh, I will be doing more 40k content eventually, for sure. So if you go to... So if you go to TotalWar.com slash blog, you can read all the article and about all the new units, but what I'm talking about building is an esports website for Total War Warhammer. So it's going to sell merchandise and fun stuff like that that Anna makes, like the uh, very awesome shield we showed earlier on the stream. But it's going to have calendars it's going to integrate the Total War esports community. So if, if players want to get involved in tournaments, like it's going to be a central hub, hopefully, where people can then get involved and uh, join these tournaments and things like that. So, uh, Case, I, I always do, typically. Yeah, I mean, not always. In the early days, I didn't. But, you know, since maybe Norska, I think I have, or Lizardman, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, and just be aware, guys. There's some questions I can't answer. Uh, Empire Lizards really needs to be a face-off. 
Yeah, I know. Get the last glimpse of the old world, right? And it's funny because Lizardmen just got a bunch of new stuff. They still feel very fresh and new, right? So now they're just getting a, a Dread Saurian and all kinds of stuff like that. But anyways, guys, Aerocrastic coming in with his Everchosen winning faction. When he did win the Everchosen Invitational against Talaxla and Soothsayer, he actually won with Setra the Imperishable. And uh, it was a very glorious victory. He was on the Chariot then, but nonetheless, it still counts. So we're going to have Setra on his big steed, which is a pretty good choice. Very tanky. Does have 95 armor, mobile, can deal with infantry. And honestly, Setra is a pretty good anti-large combatant, even though it says bonus for his infantry. Because he does have the sword and some really good buffs. So... Cetra on the Sphinx is a really, really good, well-rounded unit. Frontline's going to be Skeleton Spears and Tomb Guard. Pretty standard stuff. Obviously not going to be winning the frontline against most Dino armies, but it can do well. On top of that, Aerocrastic does have Skeleton Chariots to hammer into Skinks. So a lot of times Felcon does like to use a lot of Skinks. He really likes to use Red Crested Skinks and regular ones and then spends all his gold on big monsters. Uh, so, you know, it's the uh, it's the way to go, right? So the Chariot's going to be super good at running over Skinks. It's like excellent, excellent at dealing with things like that. Uh, so on top of that too, Shopti Great Bows, pretty much a standard. Uh, the main way to take down Source Old Bloods, Krokar, you know, Flying Threats. The Shopti Great Bows are a must. One group of Sneaky Snakes in the back, one group of uh, the Blessed Legion, and that is it. So Windblast certainly can be very punishing against a force like this, especially one that has invested in the Blessed Legion of Demonetization, but we'll see how that goes. So on top of that, we got Skink Cohorts. We do have uh, Red Crested Skinks here in the front line. We have Feral Carnosaurs, Croxagores, and it looks like Krokar. Windblast, of course, is just so good against Tomb Kings. And it looks like Felcon is going to be coming in with a pretty heavy metal air force. So he does have the Palhawks of Sentinels, and it looks like two groups of Pterodon Riders. Nice little force right there. Oh, I know. Yeah, don't worry, guys. So Anna and I are going to be making a WordPress website. So we're both a little bit noobish at it, but we're going to be doing that tonight. We're going to like, it's not going to be done tonight, but we're going to start laying the foundation and planning the site. Hopefully in the next two months, we'll have our Total War eSports website up, which will have uh, ranking power rankings for players. It's going to have uh, tournaments that you guys can all join. It's really going to be a gateway into the multiplayer community, which, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly tough to find your way into these community tournaments sometimes, unless you're like in the discords and things like that. Very good wind blast going down from Falcon right there. Able to slap those Tomb Guard with Halberds in the back, slapping that sweet, sweet base. And in the meantime, Skeleton Chariots are going to be falling back. And it looks like some Spears and Tomb Guard are going to be surging in to protect the Chariots. But so far, so good. Ushapti Great Bow are going to be focusing down the Croc scores, which is a good choice. Taking out the Mass is going to open up the Chariot play because Chariots, the only way to really stop them is with Mass. So if you deal with Mass with your Archers and your Bows, then the Chariots are going to be pretty swiggity sweetie. Granted, Falcon has a lot of pressure. I mean, these Pterodon Riders coming in, the Feral Carnosaur is on top of the Ushapti Great Bows. And you can see he's 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 building hype for his uh you know his big papa coming in the uh, dread saurian in a couple weeks so he's getting there he's stomping the yard he's having a good time and you know just laughing all the way to the bank on top of that we do have the powhawks of sentinels and the pterodon riders flying overhead and they might be dropping some rocks tomb king's back line is very heavily compromised and aerocrastic losing the shoppy grapos this quickly i think is a pretty uh, grim toll here however he does have the feral carnosaur rampaged and if the sneaky snakes with the Jajoff's incantation of cursed blades are able to finish off the Feral Carnosaur, that could be a worthy trade for the Ushapti Grapos in terms of cost. Up in the high ground here, or the air I should say, the Pterodon Riders are shooting, and it looks like they're actually going after the Sneaky Snakes maybe. Cube of Darkness casting those guys, I'm not really sure what that would do on them, but uh, the Feral Carnosaur does have Harmonic Convergence and Cold Blood, so very, very good play by Felcon. He's actually able to stabilize the Feral Carnosaur using the Cold Blood buff. It would have broke otherwise. But in the back though, Arrow still has a pretty good firing line despite the circumstances. He has the Ushapti Grapos, Ooh, but the Blessed Legion just got rock dropped by the Powhawks of Sentinel. Outstanding drop right there, but look at this discipline here by, uh, by Aerocrastic. He's keeping the Necro uh, Necropolis Knights right here, really just making sure to kind of protect his bow line. Over here, Cetra's in the 2v1 duel. He's fighting two T-Rexes, which certainly is not a fun situation. Blessed Blade has been popped, plus he narrows Incantation of Protection, so Aerocrastic on a roll here, just kind of taking the Feral Carnosaur and this uh, Croc Guard of Town here. Croc scores are going to be surging in, uh, which, you know, they don't have a bonus for his large or anything like that. But if they are, you know, facing off against, for example, you know, these AP Constructs, at least they still have, you know, AP themselves. Aerocrastic's going to be following up with Spears, and it looks like the Ushapti Grapo in the back are just being taken apart by these Pterodon Riders. They're just sitting here with their haggard little darts, and they're killing the Ushapti Grapos, which is huge. However, guys, you can see here that one of the big dinos is running. Krokar is on the run. He's broken. I don't know if Aerocrastic has anything to chase that off. Nice wind blast right there by Felcon. But the battle's actually very, very close. Uh, but, you know, something that's going to be a big issue is going to be Setra. I don't know if Felcon has his stopping power without Krokar. And it looks like some of the Ushapti Grapos are still online and shooting. Nope, they actually just disappeared. That was the last of them. The Kepra Guard are also in the build as well. Did not notice those guys fighting. But Setra's in really good shape. Tomb Kings do have ample support. Uh, they have, you know, a bunch of skinks. But Felcon does have a resurgence. He has the Fer uh, Feral Carnosaurs coming back in. Krokar does have Cold Blood activated. And, I mean, he still has 2,000 HP. Oh, Hand of the Gods going down. Blast Setra in the dome piece. Hitting him for probably close to a thousand damage, which is absolute lunacy. It's a really good value right there. Such of the Imperishable is going to be jumping over here, and uh, the cohort of Sotek and Company 
You know, they're unbreakable. These little uh, little skink boys are holding pretty firm, and it looks like the big feral carnosaurs are going to be going after the chariots, trying to take away the mobility here for Aerocrastic. Cetra's coming in. He isn't as buffed as before, though. He doesn't have his blade, nor does he have the uh, curse blades or uh, Nero's incantation of protection, so it's going to be a little bit scarier. However, something to note is that Arrow probably still does have his Ushapti Summon in the back pocket. Yes, he does, and there it goes. So the Ushapti Summon has been dropped back here behind the dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs. Feral Carnosaur is broken, which is huge. Uh, so if that thing actually you know, breaks off the battlefield, that's going to be game-breaking. And the Sneaky Snakes, the remnants of them, all two of them are going to be chasing Krokar, but it looks like Krokar is going to get away. So Falcon's certainly still in this game. I mean, he has this big Air Force, potential for some cycle charging, and what he's probably going to do is wait for the Ushapti summon to disappear. So this is a fake summon, or not fake, but it's a summon. So it's going to be disappearing in probably a matter of a minute or a minute and a half, give or take. And uh, he's just going to wait that out. And then from there, he's going to go in for an Alpha Strike with all his Pterodons and just use his mobility to pick off the rest of the Tomb King's forces. So actually getting a little bit ballsy here, going in to fight against some of the Pauhawks of Sentinels and when there's Croc scores nearby too. So trying to die back here, but it looks like Arrow is going to be pulling in his Tomb Guard and some of these other troops. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Looking good up in the sky. Pterodon Riders from Pelcon are coming in. I wonder if they're going to be diving here, just going for a big surround on Tetra. Probably not. They're out of ammunition, so there's no more poke coming in. The Feral Carnosaur is back online, which is actually quite important for Felcon. And it looks like the uh, Felcon here is able to kind of secure a pocket over here. So the Tomb Guard, Palbritz, and company are going to be uh, maybe getting cleaned up. These Tomb Guard probably will break to the Onslaught of Skinks and Croxagors. Yeah, it's only a matter of time. So I don't know. Felcon might be able to get his way back in this game. However, really nice pick here by Arrow as well. He's able to get on top of the Croxagors, and the Samadu Shopti are going to be, uh, be disappearing here in a second. So guys, I want you to watch the bounce of power right here. So if you see the bounce power is going to be creeping back towards the middle, and a one, and a two, and a three. I went into the poo count, wasn't quite perfect, but it's going to be going, and bounce power does shift a tiny bit, it looks like. It was hard to tell there. Now, this is actually really good for Arrow. He still has the Blessed Legion of Demonetization, so these guys can actually still put out some punch. They are crumbling themselves, so it's not going to be pretty, and the last of these Croxagors who are cold-blooded. Oh, he gets taken out pretty good there, and these Croxagors may break, but cold-blooded plus 16 is keeping them from wavering and breaking, which is nice. And it looks like Felcon forming a bit of an air force here. He's got his Pauhawks as Sentinels. He's got all his Pterodon Riders, his Skinks. And they're able to form a nasty little pocket down here. So suddenly it looks like Felcon might be able to get back in this game. Granted, the Kepra Guard are no small feat to deal with. I mean, these guys regenerate. They're beefy in combat. And they're going to be extremely difficult. On top of that, he does have 105 Spears. A very healthy group of Spears here. And it looks like, you know, a somewhat healthy group of, I mean, I wouldn't say healthy, but uh, there's numbers. He has 49 halberds right here that can still make a pretty big difference. Felcon, of course, being a veteran player, is going to be going after the scraps here, knowing that he's a little bit behind in the battle, so he's going to have to claw his way back in by picking off the remnants of the army. And remember, guys, the Tomb Kings are going to crumble, so the longer this fight goes, I mean, the Tomb Kings are going to be kind of buckling down in that respect. Cetra does get the Cursed Blades, and it looks like Nero's Incantation coming in. He sees the Alpha Strike coming in from the Carnosaurs, and he's going to be trying to get back to his Spears, which is smart, but at this point, he has to turn and fight. So Cetra turns, and he pimp slaps that Feral Carnosaur just right in the face. And the Carnosaur here, 479, 450. Oh, and the Feral Carnosaur goes down to Cetra the Imperishable. The Nero's Incantation really strong, but this is going to be the deciding factor here. If Cetra can beat Krokar, it's over, but if Krokar, who's super saucy right now, he's able to get away or perhaps win the fight, that's going to be game breaking as well. But the Tomb Kings have a better core for sure. The Halberds and the Spears are going to be doing just a ton of work here. And Cetra is, uh, you know, kind of braying here, not sure what to do. Krokar is a lot more beat up though. Uh, 1.5k on Krokar and uh, 2.3 here. But the rear attack coming in might be pretty bad for Cetra. But it looks like Cetra is able to create some distance here on his big Colossal Steed. And he's going to be turning around right here to charge. So we'll see if he's able to get in there and do some work. So here comes Cetra the Imperishable. Dejaf's Incantation of Cursed Blades going down. Croc scores are uh, terrified. And uh, Jesh. And uh, Cetra the Imperishable here is still uh, still going. A little bit of lag here in this last second here. Hopefully it'll stabilize in a moment. Of course, players are uh, connecting from across the world. So it tends to happen from time to time. Let's go champ is what the uh, chat reads. Yeah, and I mean, Tomb Kings are crumbling a little bit, guys. The Pterodon Riders might be able to get in there and you know, crumble them a little bit quicker, but it's really going to come down to the Cetra duel. So Cetra has all the buffs popped, the swords popped, the Jaffs is caught, popped. This is when he needs to fight. So if Cetra could beat Krokar, it's going to be a Tomb King game 100%. But if Krokar wins, that definitely opens up an avenue for a possibility here. So Krokar does take a blow. We're in the big monsters fight. The uh, the Blessed Blade is lowering the combat stats of Krokar, but his stats are just so insane, it doesn't make that much of a difference. And it looks like Cetra is kind of losing this duel a little bit. The Skin Priest of Heaven's coming in as well and getting those rear attacks is quite nice. Krokar is at 1300 HP. Cetra does kind of normalize the battle a little bit, putting him down to 950. And uh, yeah, we're going to see. It could potentially be a terror out here on the Skink Chief because he's not immune to psychology. And it looks like he's going to get terror routed. And it looks like the Tomb Kings are going to be pulling out this victory here. They probably are. Very well played to these two players. Just, just outstanding stuff. And Krokar shattered due to army losses. And Aerocrastic is going to be taking that game. Well played. Well played there. That was, a, that was quite a ferocious cockfight. So, uh, yeah, two very competitive players, competitive builds. 
And uh, yeah, that was that was a fun one. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that show down there. The Tomb King's able to hold firm with Setcha the Imperishable leading the charge. So let's go ahead here. Oh, I minimized instinctively to uh, to get rid of the, to change the scoreboard, but we're not doing a tournament or anything. You guys want one more? We're done. I'm good either way. <laughs> Falcon says old ones will be avenged. Last game. So we'll do the last game here. We're going to give uh, Felicon a chance to even up the score. And uh, yeah, we'll call it from there. Yeah, drop a like, guys. There's 500 people here, which is pretty surprising for like a, a Thursday night stream. So do drop a like. It does help me out quite a bit. Grilled Dinos? Yeah, it looks like it. Oh, my back. Let's plug it in the laptop, guys. But man, oh man, am I excited for that DLC. That is going to be good and tasty, to say the least. It's going to be just just good. A couple weeks. Falcon coming in with Dark Elves. And these guys are both like two like very, very good people. So I'm not going to worry about stream sniping. It's just not going to happen. They wouldn't do that to each other. They're like friends too. The standing desk is great, Ellie. I must say, it's like, it's made my casting easier. It's helped my shoulders. Uh, my, my legs and feet get a little bit tired, but I do have something called a, like an ergonomic pad. So it's like this uh, cushioned pad I stand on, which makes it a lot easier. So yeah, it's, it's really good. Are you doing any leg lifts or squats? I should probably do some squats, yeah. Like just get down there and do that. I mean, I walk around every now and then for sure. Matthew Smith, thank you for the $10 donation. Like, 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 yeah. Listen to the man, he's wise. How high are your monitor and keyboard in relation to your face? So my keyboard? Like my, the, the, the top of the monitor is like aligned with my like vision basically. Well, the monitor is a little bit higher than my head. So I'm like looking, I'm not looking up or down. I'm looking like perfectly straight right into the action. Uh, the keyboard is, is a, at a 90 degree angle, give or take. That's something I could work on a little bit, but it, it's relatively ergonomic. It's certainly better than my previous setups I, I've had. Um, Alrighty. Cool, cool. So a lot of good stuff coming up. We are going to have the uh, the Eternal Challenger League Season 3 is going to be starting as soon as the DLC drops, like right after that. We're going to have the World Cup starting this month. And uh, of course, like I said, the new website being launched sometime in the next two or three months. Uh, so a lot of fun stuff on the horizon for Total War. I know the creaking floor is like so annoying. I live in an old house and like the place where my desk is, it's like it creaks really bad. So it's like, and I have to move around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's annoying. So yeah, Pelcon's going to be playing Dark Elves. Aerocrastic is going to be on uh, on Chaos, which is a fun matchup. I think it's one that maybe slightly favors Dark Elves. I just feel like they're a stronger faction in general, but Chaos certainly has good tools against them. We've seen them, you know, Chaos beat Dark Elves in a multitude of matchups in high-level tournaments, so... Arcade Warrior, what's cracking? I see, I, I see you have a check mark. I gotta give me one of those, man. I'm just all primitive over here. <laughs> give me one of them check marks. Someday, perhaps. Oh my God, Arcade Warrior, you got a big old channel, dude. I just, I just googled that. 1.6 million. Jeez. So that's how you got the check mark. Fair play, man. Thanks for joining the stream. Uh, today we're just kind of wrapping up the. Uh, we, we talked about the DLC for the first 40 minutes of the stream, and then I played a couple games, and now we're having a showdown between these two high-level players. So thank you for joining, man, and uh, congrats on your channel size. That is uh, very, very impressive, my friend. Yeah, we'll see if Elkon can even out the score in this uh, this clash of fates between uh, two uh, ever-chosen veterans. Perhaps so. Matt L. Turn, if you need help with web design, Adobe Dreamweaver is pretty good. I'm trying to find the book I used to navigate it through college. Uh, Matt, I'm going to be using WordPress to make the website. WordPress is pretty... Something I... I used to work at a newspaper back in the day. Uh, so I worked as like a, a writer and a cop, you know, editor and on the website. So we used WordPress there. So that's what I'm familiar with. What's up, Sawyer Jones? What's going on, man? What is cracking? If Chaos will stop Shades from shooting, they will win. You know what? But a lot of Dark Hill players... See, here's the thing. If you bring Shades against Chaos, you have to protect them. 
right? Chaos is one of the best Zerging factions in the game. If you have uh, Chaos Knights or Hounds or any number of units like that, it is so easy to swiggity swooty and get all up in that booty. So what you do against Chaos instead is you bring Dark Riders with the Peter Crossbows. Chaos, like, you can defend those pretty easily with Coldwell Knights and Harvesters, and then from there you get to fire with Impunity. So that's why I think that the uh, Dark Riders with the Peter Crossbows are much better in this matchup. Falcon making a couple changes to his build here in the last second. And we'll see what happens. Oh, Felcon bringing in an ace unit. Oh, you guys are you guys are in for a treat. He brought he brought a truly fun unit. So, what's up, Graham Elliott from Florida? Hope you're doing well. Isn't there like tropical storms down there and stuff? Oh my goodness, be be careful. Exactly, Game Cruise. Yeah, I'm gonna be using a, a managed hosting service with WordPress, so it'll be pretty easy. But yeah, basically, I just want to make this Total War website like a hub. So. Like, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably curious, like, how to get into multiplayer. Like, is there a platform you can go to that has everything? Well, ideally, all tournament organizers can send me the information and I can put it up on the website and bam, case closed. Like, you guys can just find it. You can join. There will be articles on how to play, links to content creators, like, all kinds of good stuff. So, Chaos Knights with Lances are my favorite unit of the game. Matt, they are just some heavy metal units for sure. Heavy metal. We don't need an army blocker. These guys are like close friends, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be terribly concerned with that. We don't need a blocker. These guys these guys won't won't do that to each other. We're playing for fun right now. There's no prizes at hand. Like they're not gonna stream snipe. Like oh, I really got to beat him this game. You know, it's like there's nothing at stake, and and also they're friends. So, all right. So here we go, guys. Felcon's build. We're gonna go first. Malekith on his big black dragon. Soul Stealer, and that's pretty much it. Soul Stealer is like the best spell in Lore of Darkness. It's just so good. It heals him, it does damage. Can't complain about that. And the Mighty Charybdis. We don't see this thing terribly often, but Felcon is going to be coming in with the Steel Charybdis chair. And as far as the matchup against Chaos, I mean, it does have a bonus for Slarge and Poison, so fighting Shaggoths is, this thing's pretty good at that. Plus, it does also have the Abyssal Terror or Abyssal Howl, which lowers leadership by 8, which is a lot. So if you're using like Lore of Darkness to synergize with this, you can lower leadership by like 24 pretty quick. So really, really strong stuff there. On top of that, we got Dread Spears and, uh, no, Bleak Swords, Dread Spears, and some Elite Troops. So Falcon actually mixing in the Black Guard to kind of hold down the front line. On top of that, we got three Repeater Crossbows, which, like I said, very, very good. They can generally do very well in skirmishing against Horsemen because they have better range. And on top of that, they can also pick apart armored targets, and they're easier to protect. Falcon, last but not least, does have some mobile pressure, I think. I could have sworn he had some Harvesters. Yeah, he has Slanesh's Harvesters, but no Coldwell Knights. He actually cut the Coldwell Knights for the Cryptus, which is pretty cool. Very, very fun stuff. Very fun stuff. Yeah, no prize except glory, yes. Uh, Chaos Marauders over here. We got a couple Halberds in the back, so Chosen with Halberds. Good to be going in nice and deep. And it looks like uh, Aerocrastic has some Dragon Ogres for anti-large. So the Dragon Ogres are certainly going to have their work cut out for them. Dueling against uh, Charybdis is going to be really rough. On top of that, oh, Archeon never chosen the Lord of the End Times. And on top of that, Archeon does have a Fireball. So Fireball is actually going to be quite good against Charybdis and uh, decent against Malekith because the Charybdis actually doesn't heal like the Hydra does. So the Fireball with sustained poke and damage can actually be really good at taking that bad boy out. On top of that, he's got Chosen with Halberds, a bunch of Marauders. So we're going to have Chosen with Halberds fighting against Black Guard, which is going to be cool. And Falcon, of course, being a, a patriot of the XMT clan, is going to be dropping his uh, signature trademark here in this game as we go forward. Yes. Good, Anakin. Good. Yes, we'll see how this goes. As far as the builds go, Dark Riders are going to be really good here. But... Yes, they can outrange the Horse Masters, but if the Horse Masters find them in open field, Horse Masters can chase them down because Horse Masters can fire 360. Whereas over here, if you look at the Dark Riders, for example, they cannot. So if you're being chased by the Marauder Horse Masters who do have better sustained combat stats, uh, it's going to favor the Horse Masters, like all day. So, uh, Nutty, it is a late night stream. We're going in hard. We're having some fun. We talked about the DLC for the first uh, 40 minutes of the stream, and now we're just closing out this last game here of the stream with a quick battle, so... Yeah, if you want to watch the discussion and everything, make sure to go back later. It'll be up in a couple hours. So here are the forces of Aerocrastic, his hounds, his poison war hounds, who are going to be a pretty good tool against Dark Riders, actually, are going to be kind of playing defensively back here, not going to be trying to get around the Dark Elf force, because typically I would probably, if I saw this army, I would be like, there's probably something hiding in the trees over here. So something lurking in the brush. Felcon, of course, is going to be putting some pressure on, but, you know, the hounds are going to be able to force these guys back, potentially. Archeon needs to be careful, though. This is really dangerous. Malekith could come in and just swiggity sweety him. Archeon cannot heal. Yeah, this is really dangerous for Felcon or for Aerocrastic here. Archeon is not going to be a great duelist here. I mean, he's going to turn around, he's going to pop all his buffs, but then what's going to happen is, is that Malekith is simply going to fly away. So Word of Pain has been popped, he charges in, he does a little bit of damage, but that's actually really good there for Arrow. He's able to get the Poison Hounds on top of those targets, and the Dragon Ogres are charging in, and now we have the Clash of Fates, so just 
Just cue the epic Duel of Fates music. <laughs> As Archeon with the Slayer of Kings is popped, and it looks like Archeon is losing that duel, but he... Oh, Chaos Knights with Lance is coming in with a fat, thundering charge, and suddenly Malekith is in a bit of a losing situation! However, Soul Stealer is going to be going down, doing some substantial damage here to Archeon, plus the Chaos Knights, Gaze of Malice going down as well. And the Cryptus is a little bit in trouble. Yeah, Archeon can certainly do some work against the Cryptus, but the Dark Elf army is coming in in force, and the Chaos army is really out of position. I mean, they are just way, way out of position here. So Chaos is going to have to fall back, but so far Archeon actually got some good trades out of that, and I wonder if he's going to stay and try and fight the Cryptus. At this point, he has to pull back because the Black Guard of Nagarond are there, and another Soul Stealer is coming down. So I think at this point, Archeon just has to kind of bite his losses and... Uh, Get away. So the Chaos Knights took a pounding, so did the Cryptus and the Harvesters and Malekith, so I would say that was a very even trade. I don't think any player really came out ahead, but again, that could change drastically. If these Dragon Ogres stay in sustained combat and just die to Halberds, that'll probably be a situation in which the Dark Elves can start to take this game. So Dragon Ogres getting pulled back, and it looks like over here the Marauders are going to be cycle charging, taking out some of the Bleak Swords here. I mean, but there's still a ton of pressure from Chaos. We have Warhounds, we have a lot of stuff here on the flank coming in. Warhounds from Aerocrastic are going to be slamming into the side of these Archers here. But I think Falcon is going to be able to micro adequately to kind of get away here. But the Dark Elves are in a bit of an ugly position. I mean, their army is a little bit kind of clumped up here. And the Chaos Infantry are now going to be uh, enveloping them relatively effectively. Chaos Knights do get a nice little charge here. But Aerocrastic, of course, going to be pulling those guys back. And it looks like Archeon's going to be going in for a duel with the Cryptus. Now, Archeon, even though he doesn't look very big, he's on horseback. So the Cryptus bonus for Slarge is actually quite good against Archeon. So Halberds are going to be surging in. And these are not these are no mere Halberds. These are chosen with Halberds. So if you go in and look... These guys are the elite of the elite in terms of anti-large halberd units, but the Cryptus doesn't really care that much. He's kind of kind of hanging out, and I think Falcon's going to pull him away from the halberds here. So Malekith is back up in the sky. I think the Bounce of Power is... Uh, I think that Dark Elves are in a bit of a better position here. A Breath Attack coming in. The Breath Attack from the Dragon did not do much damage, actually. It seemed like it missed, and it mostly rose to the Dread Spears. And Archeon's probably saving up for Fireballs. I mean, Fireball Spam on top of the Cryptus to finish it could be quite good, but it looks like Archeon's going to be going in for a charge on Malekith, which is a, a bold strategy cut. And I don't know if I agree with that play because Malekith is just going to pull back. Oh, but he gets a big blow, so making me eat my words there. As he does pop the Flaming Sword of Ruin, Chaos Knights here are going to be engaged versus the Slaanesh's Harvesters, and the Harvesters are probably going to be falling here. Granted, there is supporting Overwatch fire coming in from the Repeater Crossbows on the far side of the battlefield, so there's some give and take for both players. Chaos Knights are pretty much done, as are the Harvesters. Now, this is really bad for Archeon. He's isolated in open field by the Cryptus and Malekith, and uh, I mean, he's pretty powerful of a combatant in terms of his stats, but he's not going to win versus a Cryptus and against Malekith. So what happens here is Aerocrastic has to have some really, really good jukes, or, you know, Felicon disengages. Now, Chaos is providing some really good pressure on the back line. You can see the Marauders are actually chasing down all the Dark Riders. Man, they're just hunting those guys. And like I told you earlier, Dark Riders cannot fire while they're uh, running from something. While they're chasing, they can, but while they're running, they can't. But... Oh man, Malekith comes in and is able to run interference. Falcon immediately redirects all his fire here, uh, fire here from these guys into the forces of chaos. And the Dragon Ogres here are really getting melted pretty bad. But how are the Chosen doing? Chosen with Halberds still going, 59 kills here. We have a full health group of Chosen with Halberds here that are in pretty good shape. And this is actually turning out to be a pretty close fight. But I think that the Dark Elves, I just don't see how you can deal with the Charybdis plus Malekith with just Archeon. I mean, there's a ton of Halberds, but if the Dark Elves wanted to right now, for example, they could simply pull back everything like all their troops and they could just use their repeater crossbows to pick apart chaos because chaos is mobility is pretty much like a non-factor at this point horse masters are breaking off the map they're very, very beat up and they just don't have the numbers to fight these kind of units here so it looks like a flaming sword of ruin may be going down right here so yes no standard die is going to be going down and a soul stealer for malekith so soul stealer does damage and heals you can see malekith's hp is just rapidly skyrocketing right here as archeon does jump into the fray and is able to break some bleak swords but I don't know, the Dark Elves have some elite troops of their own, and the Gaze of Malice going down, really punishing the Chosen right there, which is pretty nasty. And here comes Archeon. Archeon's going to be going after the Cryptus. Now, this is something that could help, but the Cryptus is probably going to be able to actually win this fight. I mean, Archeon is very, very damaged at this point. So we'll see if he's able to break down the Cryptus. Cryptus is at 40 leadership, 3,000 HP on this bad boy. Halberds are going to be surging in. Archeon is trying his best. He is able to do some really good damage, but like I said, Malekith is healthy now. He was able to heal Soul Stealer. And the Cryptus here is going to be probably terror out in a lot of these troops. Because Chosen and Marauders, obviously, uh, not obviously, but Chosen could be in the psychology, but they're not. And the Cryptus is uh, you're doing a really good job. I mean, it's shipped about 400 HP off Archeon. Malekith is going to be coming in, but it looks like Malekith is going to be flying up and around and trying to get the rear charge. But look at this. Archeon is actually outdueling this Cryptus very, very efficiently. Nice breath attack right there on the Chosen. Is able to get some work done. And Archeon is fighting the good fight. Is he going to be able to do it? Oh, and he slays the Charybdis! Archeon, the ever-chosen, even if he loses his battle, a true hero. Able to win that fight, slaying that beast. But now there's just nothing left for Chaos. I mean, there's just there's just the Chosen who are going to be crumbling here. And Archeon's just on the hunt, but he's being hunted down by Malekith. And, uh, I mean, with all the support Malekith has, like, I just don't see Archeon winning this. But 
Man, Archeon taking out that Cryptus was quite an impressive feat, to say the least. So over here, Archeon Ever Chosen, 1100 HP is going to be dueling to the bitter end. Truly a bitter warrior of the Chaos Gods. And uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see here. Here comes Archeon Ever Chosen. It's fully surrounded, but the Witch King of Nagarond is going to be coming in here and uh, probably will seal his doom. But of course, Malakith not, has no love for his, his kinsman here, as the dragon does roast a couple of his fellow compatriots. Now, Archeon's trying to fight. He's got about 800 HP, but he is going to be breaking due to army losses. I mean, it's just insurmountable odds at this point. So very well played to both those players, guys. It was a, it was a great game. It was a very, very good game. It was good, Anakin. Good. So, Aerocrastic won the first game. Felcon won the second game. Everyone's happy. It's a nice little, nice little good feeling for everyone, and uh, that'll be it. So, ah, uh, my fish beast. It was fun, guys. Thank you for all. 1-1 one, one between you. So, big thanks to Aerocrastic. Please make sure to check out his YouTube channel. And also Felcon over on Twitch. He does have a Twitch channel, which he does stream on every now and then. <laughs> Great times. Eric Krasik says there's more like it. It can't regrow heads, you know, says Felcon. I'll fish another one out. All right, so well played to those two fine gentlemen. And on that note, I'm going to go hang out with my smoking hot wife. And uh, yeah, we're just going to have a good time. Great play from both players. It was really fun. So again, guys, in summary for the stream, for anyone, anyone who's here and is wondering what they missed earlier, first 45 minutes of the stream, we had a breakdown of the DLC. And then I played a, a three games versus Aerocrastic and then Falcon and Arrow just played two games. So a lot of good games to watch on the stream if you guys are looking for some fun content to tide you over. And if you wanna watch the analysis, head on back. The video will be up in a couple hours. I just have to let YouTube process it and we'll go from there. Special thanks to Matthew Smith for the $10, Case Corona for the five, Deidre, Cat, Sunforge Gaming behind you, and Anthony Orlikoff, or, oh, did I read that wrong? Orlikoff, yes, for the donation on the PayPal. So guys, thanks for joining on this lovely stream. I've had a great time and uh, good times coming soon. Man, a lot of fun stuff on the horizon for uh, the Total War Warhammer community, so. Loremaster of Sotek is also streaming soon, apparently, so stay tuned for that. Head on over to Loremaster of Sotek's channel if you haven't had enough. He can actually talk about the lore as well, which I can't. So I don't know anything about the lore of these characters. So I'm sure you'll get the full Monty from him. All right, guys, you guys rock. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you, Eric Krasik and Falcon. You guys are absolute badasses. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll see you guys on the flip side, all right? Take care.